Okay. I got it. Okay. Um, get rid of that. Okay. So last time we went through, uh, we talked about the, um, you know, the, the sort of the standard regimen for uh, traumatic brain injury. And, um, you know, what we do is down the road a piece, uh, three months out, 12 months out, um, and down the road. Um, we, you know, we see the folks who are, are kind of uh, in, a, in, in a bind and, and you know, they've, they've, they've not recovered from their, um, from their um, uh, uh, brain injury. So um, uh, post-traumatic uh, uh, brain injury, the most common symptoms are depression and fatigue. Um, depression almost 100 percent fatigue uh, uh rather sorry fatigue rather almost 100 percent depression 50 to 77 percent um it, patients within three months um and um the um process is actually has been uh the pinned down to these neuroactive steroids and a disruption in the neuroactive steroids creates um a um uh, a, a, a aberration in uh, serotonin and dopamine, and you get uh, a change in shape, uh, uh, diminution, and uh, decrease in in, in numbers. Um, and what we what ends up uh, in the hormone world is that we get a, a, a effects in LH, FSH, which are the sex hormones, and growth hormone. And these are these are the hormones that we see that are most commonly um, disrupted with. Um, uh, 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 traumatic brain injuries. So um, within uh, within three months, um, all patients have, 56% of the patients have some sort of anterior pituitary insufficiency. And at 12 months, this is post-injury, 36% of them remain uh, with some sort of uh, pituitary insufficiency. And um, uh, the one that concerns us the most is growth hormone because that's that one actually increases as time goes on. Um, not decreases. Um, uh, within a year, almost 40% of the patients have some sort of uh, symptoms of low growth hormone. So um, it behooves us to take a look at that. So that's this is the first one we looked at. Um, and and, and as, as I just stated, 20% uh, of uh, patients within, uh, uh, within three months have a growth hormone deficiency and 35 to 40% of them, um, it, it almost becomes permanent. So just to remind you what growth hormone, how, how it's generated, um, it's generated in, it has um, two areas of um, uh, generation, uh, mostly, in, mostly in the hypothalamus uh, via the growth hormone releasing hormone um, that stimulates the pituitary uh, to produce growth hormone. There's a secondary pathway in the ghrelin pathway in the stomach, which, re, which uh, stimulates the growth hormone releasing peptide. Mm -hmm. And the two of those together stimulate the pituitary to uh, produce growth hormone. Growth hormone itself is somewhat inert. It has to convert in the liver into IGF-1. And IGF-1 is the um, tissues, is the, um, is the um, uh, hormone that exerts its uh, effect on the tissues. And so we discussed briefly um, uh, autistic kids um, who have high IGF-1 levels, um, even at or rather high growth hormone levels at one to three months of age um, versus their peers, but low IGF-1 levels. And so there's a disconnect. What happens is there's a disconnect between uh, growth hormone and IGF-1, and it appears to be, have uh, an inflammatory um, uh, 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 component to it, uh, particularly interleukin-6. So growth hormone itself does produce some interleukin-6. Um, and uh, so we found this out, uh, in, I think it's Montefiore Hospital in New York City, um, has a, 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 an autistic uh, a, a children's clinic, and they've been treating the, these kids with IGF-1. Now, if they have high, high growth hormone levels, you would think that it would make things worse, not better, but they do, they do, their behavior does improve. And so there's a disconnect between growth hormone and IGF-1. What we found is that these kids have um, their um, head size at age five, um, the size that they should be uh, at, at the maximum peak, which is around the age between ages 14 and 16. So these are the symptoms of growth hormone deficiency. Um, these are issues with memory, concentration, starting and finishing projects, multitasking easily or not, um, rapid gateway gain, weight gain, 
dark moods, paranoias, obsessive compulsive tendencies, and anxiety. These over here on the left are what's known as executive function, and there's a deficit in executive function with growth hormone deficiency. And you'll see this over and over again in patients with moderate to severe um, traumatic brain injuries and even those with mild more traumatic brain injuries. And so I think I showed you the slide before. And so this executive function deficit was one of those aha moments that, that connect, we connected the dots. Um, this is just a sort of a formal um, uh, look at executive function. It's just what I told you. Um, and um, so in the growth hormone, the immediate traumatic brain injury uh, time frame. Uh, when we balance growth hormone thyroid and the uh, the sex hormone axis within 48 hours, there's a decreased mortality by 50%. Um, growth hormone uh, replacement improves cardiovascular risk. It reduces that interleukin-6 I just mentioned. C-reactive protein, homocysteine, it improves concentration, memory, depression, anxiety, fatigue, um, lean body mass. Uh, and uh, and this was from that Rudman study in the 1990. Um, with with get now they got the IGF one levels over to over 300. Our goal is usually 200 to 250, but there was a, almost a 14.4 percent decreased mass in, in adipose tissue and increase in skin thickness. These are the symptoms of, of hormone growth hormone deficiency, and a lot like testosterone, strength, energy, sense of well being, muscle tone. Uh, blood sugar um, uh, or insulin resistance, blood sugar uh, is in inversely related to growth hormone levels. Um, weight gain is inversely related to growth hormone levels. Increased low density lipoprotein um, uh, with low growth hormone levels, uh, poor muscle tone, poor immune uh, uh, function, and increased triglycerides. Um, uh, untreated growth hormone deficiency, there's an increase in mortality by up to 25% in males and 43% in females. And this was a study done post MI, three years post MI, patients that had uh, adequate growth hormone uh, had, were, had a 300% um, decrease in mortality here. And all the women in the study survived over three years. And some men, it was three to one and total was 3.80 to 8.84. So downstream is the active ingredient for growth hormone. That's the IGF-1. And we can you can get IGF-1. We can use that um, with, and, and sort of bypass the, uh, the um, uh, you know, con conversion in the liver. Um, and it comes as an injectable. Uh, Low-dose IGF-1 treatment will increase the number of neurons in the brain. It promotes adult hippocampal neurogenesis. Uh, and exercise neurogenesis is mediated by IGF-1. With decreased IGF-1, there's cognitive dysfunction. With increased IGF-1, um, we got in improved uh, motor performance, improved uh, information processing and fluid speed. And it acts in con concert with a uh, 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 brain-derived uh, neurotropic factor. Here are the lab values. And lab values for growth hormone are somewhat tenuous to get. We 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 sort of rely on IGF-1. I know Dr. Gordon likes um, getting all of them. And uh, for kind of for us, it's kind of a, a cost kind of thing. Um, but so, the, but here are the lab values. Growth hormone um, uh, should be, these are the medians, should be about 5.0, IGF-1, 200 to 250, and IGF-BP3, which is the growth hormone binding uh, protein, the, the most prominent one is 70% of the binding protein is at about 4,000. You can do stimulation tests. And uh, the last one here the, on the right here, macimorelin is an oral one. That was approved in 2017. Um, so we give you uh, the MAC and Morellin. We take your growth hormone levels uh, every half hour for two hours, and the growth hormone level should stay under 5.0. The glucagon, or the, rather the insulin tolerance test is sort of the gold standard, but you can get um, uh, hypoglycemia uh, with that. So we're sort of leaning more and more to the MAC and Morellin um, uh, test. Um, injectables, uh, treatment, uh, um, uh, doses 0 0.8 to 1.2 units five days a week is, is the usual one. And then we've talked about te peptides before. So Semarelin or CJC 1295 uh, with um, uh, a, a growth hormone releasing uh, peptide. Um, uh, uh, Ipamorelin is a synthetic one that we use now. Um, it, so that, that covers the both pathways uh, that I showed you earlier. Um, there's a another formulation with what's called drug affinity complex. It has a lysine molecule in it. 
added to the CJC 1295, and that extends the half life of these of the um, peptide from six hours to six days. You will get a hot flash with it. In fact, if you don't, it, it probably was ineffective or the dose was too low. And it starts about five minutes after the injection, and it lasts for about 15 minutes. Uh, only the men complain. Um, there are oral um, homeopathic sprays. Um, that, that uh, from university compounding, secretropin and dinotropin, which are actually the same thing, but dinotropin is marketed to, to uh, lay people, secretropin is marketed to, to uh, uh, healthcare providers. Um, and uh, we usually start with that, either that or ibutamorin, which is uh, MK677, which is a, um, an oral uh, 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 peptide. Um, that follows the uh, growth hormone releasing hormone, uh, the, the pituitary pathway. Um, and so it, it comes as a spray. We do three sprays at bedtime. We'll do that for three months. Uh, or the ibutamorin MK677. Uh, we'll use 10 milligrams for females, 25 milligrams for males. We'll retest it in three to four months. Um, if it's increased, we'll continue it for another six months and then decrease it. If there's no change um, after six months, then we'll use the uh, injectable peptides. Um, and, and lately we've been using the CJC 1295 with the DAC, well, once a week shot, or that's mostly what we'll use. Um, if there's no change after that, then we'll do one of the stimulation tests and then we'll consider uh, HGH. HGH is by the FDA is, it's illegal to use for anti-aging. Um, it's horrendously expensive. Uh, there's a couple of places that have sort of sort, sort of semi knockoff ones that, that we've really not that, that are a lot less expensive, but we've not really been happy with them. Natural enhancements for growth hormone, melatonin at 10 milligrams, and then all the rest of these, you'll see that they will increase growth hormone levels quite su substantially, but they, they'll, it'll rise in three in 30 minutes and they'll usually be gone within two hours. So you need to, you know, to, you know, dose it frequently if you want to get a steady level. So arginine, uh, creatine, and uh, creatine um, is one, and then ornithine. Um, usually you'll see uh, combinations of these. GABA will increase growth hormone by 400% uh, within two hours, 200% within 30 minutes post-exercise. Um, ashwagandha, 300 milligrams twice a day, can increase growth hormone by up to 200%. Again, short term. Adequate vitamin D um, will stimulate IGF-1 and, and, and the IGF-BP3 uh, 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 protein uh, 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 transport a mechanism. L-DOPA, the patients who get L-DOPA, you know, for Parkinson's disease, will see a, 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 a spike in growth hormone within 60 minutes. Um, again, it, it's gone within about two to three hours. Um, glycine and glutamine will also increase um, growth hormone levels. And this last one at the bottom, uh, I wrote this for a CME course, so I had to put it in as an investigational combo. But this is Cerevital. We, you know, they, they advertise on TV a million times a day. Um, and it does increase growth hormone levels by um, 682%, again, within about an hour, but it's gone in about three hours. And that's the, the formula. So here's the secretagogues we talked about, um, secretropin, dinotropin, or ibutamorin. That's where we start, CJC-1295 with ipamorelin or DAC. That, that's our next line of attack, and then HGH. So remember, we've had our patient Olivia. This was the young girl that got hit in the hit between the eyes with a, a volleyball, and her, she kind of went downhill from there. She had uh, visual issues. Um, she had behavioral issues. Um, um, she was growth hormone level was 0 0.6 and IGF one again, 78. Remember she's 18, 19 years old. Um, you know, they should be much higher. Um, and, um, and so, um, uh, estrogen and quercetin can stimulate IGF BP three, um, as, as, uh, we noted side effects from growth hormone, think of pa the, the acronym page. So paresthesias, um, arthralgias, joint pain, um, glucose or insulin uh, resistance and swelling edema. Okay, so that's growth hormone. Anybody have any questions about that? If not, we'll go on. Okay, so next um, we're going to talk about testosterone. As you know, we can talk about testosterone for 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 weeks and weeks in their societies, but I'll try to give you an overview here. Again, and with, with an emphasis on, you know, what, what we do with traumatic brain injury. 
Um, but I, I, I kind of like this here, you know, everything, nearly everything we learned about it in medical school was wrong. Um, this is where I was going to start. So this is our part three and what happens after the El Kabong. So um, just, uh, just as a, an aside, um, so these are uh, the daily production of hormones, and this is how we should dose things. Um, you know, these are normal physiological doses of hormones uh, at, at, our, at our peak at eight, around age 25. So as you see, testosterone, five to 12 milligrams, cortisol, 20 to 30 milligrams. Um, you know, we're not going to be giving androstenedione, um, but DHEA, 15 milligrams, uh, DHEA uh, sulfate at 50 milligrams. So you need to keep those, those, um, those levels in mind when you're, you don't want to be, uh, you know, overdosing patients. Uh, that's not so good. Testosterone biosynthesis, um, the hypothalamus for the gonadotropin releasing hormone stimulates the anterior pituitary to produce FSH and LH. FSH uh, stimulates the Sertoli cells to, to create sperm. So our acronym here is Sertoli sperm. LH uh, stimulates the Leydig cells to produce testosterone. 95% of it in, in males is in the um, testes, 5% in the adrenal gland and off to secondary sex characteristics. In, I, I didn't put females in here. I should have, I apologize. Um, so about 50% of the, of the testosterone is produced in the, in the um, adrenal gland. Uh, and the, the other 50% uh, is, is a mix between uh, the um, uh, 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 ovaries and, um, and fat, fat cells. Um, uh, testosterone uh, is produced in the lytic cells. Its, its production is, is uh, uh, controlled by the availability of cholesterol. Imagine that on the outer membrane of mitochondria, um, and the rate of transfer is the uh, sort of the control of the uh, production of testosterone, and that's called steroidogenic um, activator protein or the star protein. Um, the, it's rate that's is the rate limiting step, and it's catalyzed by cytochrome P450. Testosterone has a half life of only about 12 minutes. Um, this is the uh, area in the steroidogenic pathway that we um, that we look at, and uh, remember again that uh, you know it all comes from cholesterol, and so you know as genius doctors who told everybody not to eat cholesterol in the 80s and 90s, um, you know what it, what it, what you know you can imagine what happened to to the hormones. You know we're talking about mostly an older population to begin with, where it slowed down or or even stopped producing, and we we just sort of made things worse. So testosterone is metabolism. It's converted into uh, DHT by 5-alpha reductase and into estradiol by aromatase. Uh, DHT uh, affects the skin, the liver, and the prostate. And it deals with things like facial and body hair, um, acne, and, and prostate growth. Um, uh, testosterone in, in total deals with bone mass and muscle formation, spermatogenesis, sexual function. And the estrogen deals with the brain. Um, uh, fat cells um, and uh, the function of the testes itself with bone resorption, brain function, and breast pro proliferation. So again, you can see just from the me metabolic pathway, um, when things get disrupted, um, it, we, you can you can sort of guess what you know what might happen. It's not a it's not a um, not a big surprise really. So um, so testosterone therapy, um, we sort of go go by this for most of most of what we do. Um, you know, so this was a song by Bing Crosby, um, accentuate the positive and eliminate the negative. Um, the last two lines, by the way, were latch onto the affirmative and don't mess around with Mr. In between. But we want to accentuate the positive as best we can, and we want to eliminate or re reduce the negative. So testosterone has a profound effect on the whole body. And testosterone is one of your anti-aging agents. Um, it has much more to do with a whole body wellness than just sex. I know that's what sells and that's what that's what you hear. And when patients come in, that's what they're gonna talk about. But it deals with memory, concentration, um, uh, uh, mental mental function, um, uh, ambition, drive you know, versus apathy. Um, it reduces heart the risk of heart disease. It lowers LDL, raises HDL. Um, it, it deals with um, the, the production of, of uh, uh, proteins. Um, sexual organs, of course, bone marrow stimulation, red blood cell count, um, bone density, and muscle tone and volume. So early in life, um, in the first two trimesters of pregnancy, 
um, testosterone uh, is, is involved with brain development in utero and the development of uh, the external genitalia for males. In the first six months of life, there's a little mini puberty and, and a lot of parents notice that the genitalia become a little bit more prominent in the first six months of life. And then in the, you know, at puberty, um, testosterone rises in, in males at, by 10 to 20 fold. The hemoglobin will rise 15 to 20%. And um, testosterone, you know, as you know, stimulates erythropoiesis. And then you get the growth spurts and, and voice deepening and facial hair. This is just a little fun fact. If you look at your fingers, um, you look at your index finger and your ring finger, and the in females, the index and, and finger and ring finger should be about even. And in males, it, the ring finger is much longer than the index finger. Um, and then there's a standard deviations here. Um, this is a ratio of the second or ring or index finger to ring finger. And that ratio is, is lower in males than in females. And you can tell um, the um, testosterone levels in amniotic fluid um, uh, but by uh, taking a look at the fingers. And if you got a patient who tells you that they're gender uh, confused, just take a look at their fingers. You can give them a pretty good idea of uh, you know where, where they allegedly should be. I'm not gonna get into the rest of that. Um, the two to four ratio is lower in, um, uh, in, in autistic uh, children. And if you, you know anything about autistic children, uh, the male to female ratio is about 10 to one. Um, and uh, a lot of times, even the girls are, uh, you know, boyish characteristics, and they're tomboys, and um, you know, all, and all of that. Um, and so, and the ratios are much lower in uh, autistic kids than in uh, those that are not autistic. So, um, prenatal uh, androgen levels are inversely correlate with social language and skills. Eye contact uh, begins at 12 months. Uh, voc uh, vocabulary size at 18 to 24 months, empathy six to nine years, social skills at 48 months. This is with adequate testosterone. Female fetal androgen levels are positively associated with autistic traits. Um, the genes, there's genes involved with steroidogenesis and there's higher rates of androgen related conditions with higher uh, testosterone levels in utero, i.e. polycystic ovary. This is just a, a graph of um, uh, the prepubescent um, testosterone levels are increased on average by 256% on our autistic children versus those that, uh, that are not peer reviewed. And there's a decrease in FSH by 35%. Testosterone sufficiency in men, that was a little aside. Um, memory, concentration, muscle mass, we talked about this. Anti-inflammatory cytokine, interleukin 10, there should be interleukin 4 on there also. Oxygen uptake, endurance, skin tone, sexual performance, and bone density are all improved. Um, with testosterone def sufficiency in men, we have um, uh, improvements or, or decrease in dry eye syndrome, low density lipoprotein, fibromyalgia, uh, pain syndrome, skin turgor, a clotting factor, sexual performance, bone density, joint pain, uh, body fat, um, we have decreases in interleukin-6, the, the inflammatory cytokines, uh, atherosclerotic vascular disease, LDL cholesterol, and, and then brain issues, anxiety, depression, mood swings, dementia, and then long-term Alzheimer's and MS risk. So again, so we have somebody that has a brain injury and they have testosterone deficiency from this. Um, you, can act, you can sort of start picking out you know, the things that you should be able to find. This is the same thing just in, in a, a, a list form. And so eliminate the negative. So these are the issues that we deal with with testosterone, uh, sleep apnea, acne, gynecomastia, erythrocytosis, benign prostatic hypertrophy, prostate cancer, testicular atrophy, and cardiovascular risk. Um, there's a lot of like knee jerk reactions. Um, so this was just a, our conclusion um, with uh, about, uh, again, prostate cancer. So, you know, everything we, we thought about, so the testosterone caused prostate cancer turned out to not be so. Um, high levels of testosterone levels do not increase the risk of prostate cancer. Ther testosterone therapy doesn't increase the risk of prostate cancer. It doesn't increase the risk of progression in men. It does not increase the, it does not cause rapid progression in metastatic uh, uh, therapy. Um, uh, everything we were taught about red blood cells was wrong also. So erythrocytosis, uh, we had a knee-jerk reaction that it was polycythemia vera, which is a, a, an increase in 
all of the red, all of the blood cells, including white cells and platelets, and that's actually a blood tumor. And it's it's on everybody seems to know about this with testosterone, but polycythemia vera is on the rare uh, disease list. It's not common at all. Um, and I'll show you in a minute the difference between the two. Um, high levels of testosterone does not increase blood tumor risk of blood tumors, uh, cardiovascular disease, strokes, or venous thrombosis. Um, I might have showed you this before. Uh, this was a study. This, if it shows nothing else that you can get grant money to study just about anything. We took about 30 uh, 20-year-old guys. Uh, we had them. We drew their testosterone levels. Had them drive around in a Porsche 911 for an hour. Redrew their testosterone levels, um, and um, there was a, a large increase in testosterone. Did the same thing with a beat up old uh, Toyota Camry, and there was a decrease. And here's that right here. This is the uh, uh, Porsche 911 highway and um, uh, downtown, and the increase in testosterone levels. And this was um, driving the um, the um, uh, Toyota Camry. I'm not sure exactly what 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 that means, except um, you know uh, it'll get the, the old saying it'll get your blood boiling. Testosterone deficiency is a major cause of depression. Remember, depression is is one of the major symptoms of uh, the sequelae of a traumatic brain injury. Um, we see anxiety, aggression, mood disorders, um, arousal issues, sexual dysfunction, suicide ideation. There are androgen receptors throughout the brain. Androgens have a positive impact on cognitive function. The, the, with deficiency in testosterone, we get depression, fatigue, and suicidal ideation. Those of you that are using testosterone for therapy, uh, you know, like the injectables, if the patients, you know, miss two or three weeks, you know, they'll start telling you that they're brooding and moody, um, and they really notice it, you know, after about um, at seven or about ten to fourteen days. Um, with um, adequate testosterone, we get mood stabilization, strength, energy, motivation. Um, it attenuates the inflammatory cytokines, interleukins 2, 3, TNF alpha, should have interleukin 6 on here, and NF kappa beta. It increases interleukin 10, which is anti inflammatory. It protects against mitochondrial dysfunction, controls neuronal excitability, improves seizure control, um, and it decreases uh, pain, anxiety. Um, it's an anti inflammatory. Um, it, it, testosterone levels are inversely related to um, uh, the degree of depression, also moderates anorexia nervosa. We can actually pinpoint um, uh, 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 serum levels of testosterone and when we can expect uh, to see um, uh, uh, depressive symptoms. Uh, patients are at risk at 295 nanograms per deciliter or six nanograms per uh, per milliliter of free testosterone, and they are at, they have frank depression at 147 and a half nanograms per deciliter, and um, free at 3.0. That's for males. From females, at risk at 22, we're a free of 1.0, and a depression at 11 and 0 0.5. So you're treating patients for um, depressive symptoms, and they're, you're not getting anywhere. It behooves you to, to take a look at testosterone levels. Um, testosterone, let's see, I think I might missed something here, and suicide. So the 10th leading cause of death in the U.S., um, uh, direct relationship between depression and suicide, and there's a direct relationship between testosterone deficiency and uh, depression and suicide, and a direct uh, relation between traumatic brain injuries, low testosterone, depression, and suicide. Men have four times the risk of females. Um, suicide attempts are inversely related to testosterone levels. Um, this information I got from uh, Dr. John Davidson, who's the head of psychiatry at, um, U at UCSF. Um, he sta he, he um, stated that um, uh, the peak years for suicide for men are age 80 to 90, which was kind of a surprise, and for women ages 50 to 65. Um, he, he attributed, he even said it out loud, that uh, attributed the loss to estrogen in the menopausal years. So my next, my question was, and he, and then he said he, he didn't really know what to do about it. I said, well, why don't you give him estrogen? And uh, in 2015, when I first heard this, he told me uh, they, they, they couldn't. Um, I saw him about a year ago, um, and you know, he, he gave the same talk with the same statistics. And he said, um, at least they're, they're um, uh, referring patients to gynecology uh, hopefully they know what they're looking at. Um, anxiety, testosterone reduces anxiety, enhances cognitive performance. It's an axiolytic, it's analgesic. Um, 
and it, that's due to uh, the action on 5-alpha reductase metabolites. Um, you can measure prolactin levels, pro low prolactin levels or a tip-off that a patient might have treatment-resistant anxiety and or depression. Um, uh, these patients have high dopamine levels. Uh, prolactin inhibiting factor becomes suppressed, which um, it, it, which will uh, uh, change the production of prolactin in the anterior pituitary. Uh, normal for prolactin is about 11 to 14. When the patients are under 6.0, uh, we usually have some sort of uh, issue with treatment resistant anxiety and depression. The usual culprits don't work very well. The SSRIs, the SNRIs don't work very well. Even the atypicals don't work very well. You really need to sort of have to go outside of the box um, to, to, to get at it. Um, the treatment for testosterone, um, daily production rates are four or five to, to about 12 per day, which translates to about 28 to 80 milligrams a week. So if we're giving patients 200 milligrams a week, you give them testosterone cypionate 200 milligrams IM, one cc, you're actually overdosing them by by two to threefold. In females, the range is about one milligram to two point eight milligrams uh, per day. So, super physiological levels are where you're going to get in trouble with estrogen and um, and um, uh, prostate issues. Um, again, so we're looking at um, converting the testosterone to DHT and testosterone with aromatase to estradiol. Um, you want to avoid estrogen excess with physiologic doses of testosterone. And some guys are just, um, you know, uh, sensitive to testosterone and even low, low levels of testosterone will, um, will produce, um, uh, they'll produce um, higher levels of estrogen. There's, there's a controversy raging in some of the groups that I belong to that we should leave the estrogen levels alone and just let them rise to, uh, to you know, to whatever they, whatever they will. Um, I don't agree with that. We've seen uh, erectile dysfunction and uh, coronary artery uh, issues with uh, testosterone levels that have been high for uh, anywhere from uh, five to five years and, and up. Uh, usually these are guys that, that come in um, that have been elsewhere where they don't check estrogen levels and they've been on tes testosterone for 15 years. And you know their estrogen levels are 80 or 90, and the testosterone isn't working very well, and they have um, uh, depression and and uh, uh, labile uh, you know emotional issues and erectile dysfunction, um, and their estrogen levels are 100 or 120. Uh, there's a couple of uh, speakers at AMMG. Uh, one in particular, he uses pellets, and he he actually gives patients estradiol. Um, he told he tells us. Uh, his his average patient has a testosterone level of 1750 to 2000 and an, an estradiol level of about 150 to 200. Um, I, I don't agree with that. Um, usually anything seven to 900 for, for males is adequate uh, for the total testosterone, a two to 4% free and um, estrogen levels. You need some. So you know, when we first started, we would block the estrogen down to zero, and that was wrong. Estrogen drives blood flow to the brain. You're going to end up with memory issues and concentration issues. Uh, the sweet spot is usually, at least in our thinking, is about 15 to 25. Anything under 40 is usually pretty acceptable. When it gets to be over 30, we'll treat it, and I'll show you in a minute what to do with that for uh, with um, um, uh, 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 supplements and over-the-counter um, uh, sort of aromatase inhibitors. We still use low-dose aromatase inhibitors. They're very inexpensive. They're easy to use. Um, they are off-label, but you're going to use a half a milligram a week, uh, one milligram a week of, of an astrazole. Um, you can get um, at Costco, you can get 30 of them for about $13. So more than six months worth, you can get for, for less than thir for $13. Um, and the side effects are really very nil, um, you know, because the doses are so low. I mean, I really don't even see them. Females, you want to use 10 to 20 milligrams a week. So you can give them a testosterone cypionate 0.1 cc IM. Um, we'll, get you, uh, we'll get you there. Um, uh, you can make creams um, and, and we also do pellets. Um, super physiologic levels of testosterone is where you're going to run into um, gynecomastia. Um, you're going to have inflammatory issues, and that's where the patients are going to end up with uh, aggression and irritability. Um, so you really don't want to overdose them. Um, uh, estrogen excess, um, you know, or estrogen 
uh, or aromatase inhibitors that are over the counter, zinc citrate, 30 to 90 milligrams. We usually do 30 to 50 milligrams. Quercetin, 250 to 500 milligrams. Quercetin usually comes with stinging nettle. Um, that's really good for allergies also. Licorice, just be careful with high blood pressure there. Uh, resveratrol, uh, we're using more and more of that. Um, and uh, that's a really a fascinating um, uh, uh, substance. Um, and uh, I've been writing, uh, uh, looking at it. We've been looking at at least 50, 50 different uses for resveratrol with very little um, side effects. DIM, one to three grams a day. Uh, progesterone cream, particularly if they have a gynecomastia, we use the cream right on the breast tissue. And uh, you can get an over-the-counter up to seven and a half percent. Um, uh, uh, you don't need a prescription for that. The other caps you do. Um, and um, you put it right on the breast tissue. And um, it, it, usually within eight to 10 weeks, you're going to notice the softening of, of the um, of the uh, uh, gynecomastia. If they have a hard lump, it may not it may not affect it. But most most times we with the progesterone cream, we can actually dissolve the, you know, the, the, the uh, enlarged breast tissue. Myomin is a Chinese herb. Um, it will increase testosterone levels and by about 20% and decrease, um, uh, uh, it, it is an aromatase inhibitor also, it'll decrease estrogen levels by about 10%. Berberine is is a, a hot item now. It's now, it's I've, I've seen it uh, labeled the uh, nat nature's ozempic. I'm not so sure about that. Uh, 500 milligrams twice a day for this use. Um, for weight maintenance and, and or loss, you need about a thousand milligrams twice a day. Um, and then there's our anastrozole or estrogen blocker. Um, uh, you can also use uh, upstream hormones to shut down um, uh, the, the, the um, testosterone uh, conversion of, to, to estradiol by uh, get, uh, increasing pregnenolone and DHEA. This is just a chart of sort of the uh, commercial products that are available. Um, and uh, so there's Clomid, and now Clom Clomid is uh, Clomiphene. Um, the, the generic makers are no longer in business, so you have to use uh, either a brand name Clomid, which is about six or eight dollars a pill. Um, uh, you can get it, we can, we've been getting it compounded at 45 milligrams a tablet, uh, and we use it usually once or twice a week, um, for about two dollars a pill. Um, if I'm allowed, allowed to mention uh, other, I don't know, Mike, if you make it, um, but um, so we get it, we, we do get it. Um, Androgel is, you know, a, a synthetic, um, uh, you know, co commercial product that is expensive. And we see a lot of side effects from Androgel because it's not pure testosterone. You know, these, the, these um, commercial products are all altered to make it a unique product. And uh, it's, um, you know, it, when they're altered like that, um, our body doesn't like it. We try to stay away from them. Uh, we do use a lot of pellets. Uh, some people don't like them at all. We do. Um, and uh, we uh, we get a steady state, um, four to six months um, use. The patients don't don't have to worry about you know uh, bringing bottles and needles with them or or pills, and they don't have to worry about forgetting things. Um, you know, getting the the cream on 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 goldfish and and uh, children and 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 uh, others, they don't have to worry about any of that. Um, and it's, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's a fairly convenient, it's the quickest onset of action. You'll get an onset of action within four to seven days for the pellets. For the cream, it'll, it will, it takes about four weeks, or no, the cream takes four to eight weeks to take effect and the injectables take four weeks to take effect. There's a couple of newer products out. I'm not sure I have them here. Um, there's testosterone undecanate. Um, there's, there's a pill form. Uh, the company claims that there's no liver involvement. That was always the issue with oral testosterone is you ended up with, with um, hepato hepatotoxicity. Um, the, pay, the, the companies that make these new testosterone undecanates say that, they, that they, their products don't. Um, you're going to have to look into it yourself and just remember, you know, that they're not always, I, I don't, don't know that, but they're not, they don't always tell you to tell, tell you the, the full story. There's a nasal form called Natesto. Um, uh, which is which is effective, but you have to use it uh, uh, three times a day. And uh, these newer ones are quite expensive. They're usually eight hundred to a thousand dollars a month. Um, you know, sometimes insurances will cover them, uh, but the old tried true ones work fine. Um, a, a compounded testosterone cream uh, should go for maybe fifty dollars a month. Um, or you, some places you can even get it for less. Um, this was a uh, you know so clomiphene. 
is um, is one of our go-tos for younger patients. And the reason we like using clomiphene is because it doesn't affect the prostate and it will not affect sperm count. Testosterone comes in like this, like like the um, like the blob, and it and it, it will shut down uh, a patient's sperm uh, uh, production. Um, you know, younger patients who who are either unsure or 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 still uh, want to uh, you know procreate. Um, you really want to stay away from testosterone. Um, the eighty percent of the time, the testosterone uh, once you stop it within six months, the sperm count will will revert to normal. But there's another twenty percent where it won't. We really don't know who that's going to happen to. Uh, the clomiphene um, is convenient. It's a pill. It it, it will um, it will increase testosterone levels on average. A fifty milligram uh, tablet will increase testosterone levels within six weeks by about 50%, so per week, that's per week. So two pills per week will double the total testosterone levels and it's pretty consistent. Um, side effects are really pretty minimal. I really, you know, there's a whole list of them, but I really, we use such low doses, we don't really see it. Um, I don't know if I even wanna read this. This was a, uh, this was a, a young, young guy who, um, this was a, a, a report that I got from a urologist um, or, or an endocrinologist. Uh, uh, no, I think it was, yeah, an endocrinologist. Um, this was a young guy who went to Cancun. Um, he got food poisoning. Um, he, he came to me two months after that, and he had Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which was new for him, and his testosterone levels were very low, uh, like around 200. And he um, he was 26 years old. Um, so we gave him clomiphene, and he, he, he recovered, and he was doing okay. He goes to the endocrinologist, and the endocrinologist says um, uh, he... In, he uh, the, the clomiphene that he's used and has had success with is not an FDA approved for this purpose. Uh, that's true. And we do not know the long-term effects. So let's go to the next slide. Long-term follow-up of uh, clomiphene for, for um, uh, hypogonadism shows that it's effective and safe alternative to testosterone supplementation in men wishing to preserve their fertility. I mean, it took me all of 30 seconds to find that. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is, I, you know, this is what we get all the time. Um, also, it's likely to preserve his fertility. There you go. Um, exogenous testosterone will suppress his testosterone and spermatogenesis, which doesn't mean it cannot recover. They're all unknowns. And it's not a good idea for young men to, to of his age to go without testosterone. And he's, he feels he's got chronic fatigue. He offered another opinion or another endocrinologist and also all, or, all to send him to a urologist for subcutaneous testosterone implants. Well, what did he just say? You know, you don't want to give this kid testosterone. And besides, I can do that myself. Um, so um, he considers his options and let him know. So, so there is um, you know evidence that the long-term uh, chronic or uh, clomiphene um, is quite safe and it's effective. We've used it for years and years and years. Um, and uh, once in a while, the patients will have a, um, some nausea or uh, 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 peripheral neuropathy symptoms, but very rarely. Um, we've used this one quite, quite, um, quite frequently. HCG, you'll get a similar. Do you think, uh, do you think if we do internase the clomiphene, we can even reduce the dose because it gets directly to the brain, and possibly this will uh, minimize any side effects, and you don't need that much. Maybe you need ten percent to twenty percent oral dose. What do you think? Uh, I don't know. I, I I don't even know if you can make intranasal uh, clomiphene. So, ask... Mike, do, can you do it intranasal? <laughs> I I would have to check. It depends on the solubility of the drug. Um, I won't say it's impossible, but uh, I'm going to say probably not. The reason I say that is that to give, let's just say you wanted to give a 10 milligram dose, um, because you're not going to get it like 10 milligrams in you know, 0.2 mils or something. It won't be that soluble. So uh, I, I doubt it's possible, but it, I can look at it for you. Okay. So HCG is, is your other go-to for um, uh, patients that are younger. Um, so again, if you have head injury people, you really want to stay away from testosterone if their testosterone is lower, uh, is low. Um, but HCG, um, the difference here is HCG is, is an injectable and it's a controlled substance. So we have some issues, you know, we have that. It doesn't affect the sperm count or testicular volume, and it's preferred for patients under 40. We use it quite extensively for, you know, to, to preserve testicular volume, um, even in long-term in, in, in older patients in low doses, being 250 units 
on day six and seven of an IM injection or every third day on a transdermal uh, gel use. A standalone therapy, uh, we'll give them uh, 3,000 units sub-Q for two weeks, and then um, 1,000 to 1,500 uh, units sub-Q twice a week. Um, you can develop antibodies to it. So sometimes what we'll do is we'll switch off, we'll use HCG, um, and, and and then we'll switch off to clomiphene. Um, two months on, one month off. Um, to uh, affect testosterone levels without using testosterone, I have uh, I have these um, uh, this for you. So exercise, high intensity in, in interval training, high protein, healthy fat diet, stress reduction, of course, adequate vitamin D, adequate sleep. Boron, three milligrams a day will reduce that the sex hormone binding globulin, which is the protein that that uh, transports testosterone in the bloodstream uh, to the to the uh, peripheral organs. Um, and if the to sex hormone binding globulin is high, um, you want to um, you want to reduce that. Um, you want to keep the sex hormone binding globulin under about fifty to sixty. Um, there is a formula. Um, anybody's interested in it uh, for for what's known as the free androgen index. Um, that we sort of can give us a, a more precise uh, level. Magnesium at 10 milligrams per kilogram per day will Im improve testosterone levels. DHEA, 50 milligrams, 50 to 100 for males, 10 to 25 for females. Ashwagandha, uh, most of the supplements that you get uh, don't have enough in it. You need 300 milligrams twice a day to affect testosterone levels. Shilajit is another Ayurvedic herb that works nicely, 250 milligrams twice a day. Um, uh, Makuna prurians um, will decrease prolactin levels and increase testosterone two, and eight, two to five grams a day. Tanget Ali, uh, myomin I note, noted before. Pomegranate seeds, pumpkin seeds, po uh, pure pomegranate juice will increase testosterone levels by up to 15% within six months, uh, rather uh, six weeks. Um, you need about uh, six ounces a day, uh, five days a week. Um, chrysin and trebilius uh, in a capsule, uh, it's a compounded capsule, will increase testosterone levels by about 10%. Shadavardi is another Ayurvedic herb, will increase testosterone levels about 30%, and maca. So there's 18 ways to raise testosterone levels without using testosterone. Here's the references for all of that. Uh, diet, um, animal-based protein. Uh, you know, the, the plant-based uh, don't really do it as far as raising testosterone levels are concerned. Whey-based shakes, 20 grams of protein, um, stay away from sugar, uh, cruciferous vegetables um, and, and carbohydrates, um, you know, the good stuff. Um, and you need a two to one ratio of carbohydrates to protein and the mono uns mono unsaturated fats of uh, nuts, olives, olive oil, uh, seeds and avocados. If we went back in time 30 years and, and presented this, we would have had our heads handed to us and we were told we were show, showing you disinformation. Saturated fats will raise testosterone levels. So whether they're good for you or not, you know, in other areas, um, you know, that's that's another story. But red meat, egg yolks and dairy will enhance testosterone levels. And you want about 25 to 30 percent of your calories from fat. 18 to 20 calories per pound body weight. Um, lower calorie diets can decrease testosterone and then the superfoods. So, you know, these berries, nuts, walnuts, and you make it into a, uh, make it into a um, smoothie. Um, it will um, help with testosterone levels. Also pomegranate juice, tart cherry juice uh, are also uh, ways to, to go about it. Um, don't, you know, don't protein excess, you know, too much is no good. Um, limit fat to 25 to 30% of your calories. Um, again, what we're trying to do here is, is, is raise testosterone levels without using testosterone, limit your fiber, and limit alcohol. Um, just for fun, uh, there's a, a, a stimulation point in the front of the ear right there called the Bosch point right here. This is the same, really. Um, the sexual desire point. And then if you want to want to turn it off, just you sort of go across to the helix here, and you just need to rub that. Okay. Okay. Um, and that's the, the the points for sexual desire. Um, any questions there? I don't have the the chat up, so uh, we'll get to that at the end if there's questions. Yeah, I, I do um, have a comment, mm -hmm. if that's okay. And and then any um, any opinions out there? Uh, so I noticed that there's been a change, a shift, I would say, towards the use of and clomiphene versus 
clomiphene. Mm-hmm. Okay, Cl- clomiphene is actually the combination of uh, enclomiphene and zooclomiphene. Right. And, uh, you know, apparently the, the, there seems to be an advantage um, with the enclomiphene uh, because of it's more of an estrogen receptor antagonist to the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland leading to an increase in FSH and LH. Um, I'm not sure as I'm still learning what the downside of, or what they found or what the advantage is 100% over the the Clomid. We'll just call it Clomid. Mm -hmm. Um, But it it may be um, that there's um, too much estrogen production with with the clomid as opposed to and clomiphene is is much more selective for men to produce more testosterone right i haven't used it i haven't used it that much i don't have that much experience with it um it was the, we we were using it because we couldn't get the we couldn't get the generic clom, uh, clomiphene that that's really where it's where it came from and a couple of the compounding pharmacies at least out here um, we're, we're producing it. It's kind of expensive compared to, to the, to the, um, you know, the, uh, regular clomiphene. And, um, so far I've not seen, a, you know, a, 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 it's, is better or worse as far as results. Um, it's, it's, to me, it seems about neutral. So, um, that, that's my experience. Okay. okay. That's okay. 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 Thanks. So, um, I know there's some questions in the chat, uh, Dr. Alasa. Should I do them or should we keep going? Oh, it's up to you. If you want to keep the flow, go ahead. Um, okay. I mean, if anybody wants to raise their hand and have a discussion, uh, I mean, it's up up to whatever the style of, of presentation you like. All right. So estrogen in the brain. So so one of the things that we did wrong early on, we really didn't have. So 20 years ago, we really didn't have any any anything to go on. Um, as you know, we had normal numbers, which are, you know, those two standard deviations. So a normal testosterone was a quest was 250 to 1100. I mean, that's not much of a help. Uh, and, um, estrogen levels, we, we, we knew too high estrogen. Um, there was, there was an issue with that. So we would, we would just use estrogen blockers to get it down to zero. Um, and you know, that really turned out to be not, not a very good idea. Estrogen maintains cerebral blood flow. Uh, it will widen uh, carotid artery lumen uh, 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 diameter by 224% with adequate test estrogen levels within six months. It lowers uh, PTSD after trauma. It modulates pain. It increases, uh, uh, it's, it's actually produced with stress. Um, it prevents cell death and it acts like a growth factor. It increases neurotransmitter qu- quantity and quality. It improves uh, a sensitivity to nerve growth factor. Um, at manual dexterity and speed, and it increases acetylcholine availability. So we need estrogen. Guys need estrogen. Girls need a little bit of testosterone. It's neuropreventative, pre- protective, it prevents neuro- neuronal loss in the CNS. It decreases risk in onset and progression of neurological deterioration in dementia, sch- schizophrenia, um, and then uh, Alzheimer's disease, and it aids in recoverings from strokes and traumatic brain injuries. And we do this all the time. It's like stroke patients, you know, we measure their hormone levels. Uh, pre-existing low estrogen levels, i.e. menopause, <laughs> menopausal patients, leave uh, women susceptible to development of PTSD. High estrogen levels are protective. So, and again, uh, estrogen modulates pain. It's the strongest predictor of acute mortality and poor long-term outcome. And the c- cerebrospinal fluid estrogen is lower in after traumatic brain injury. Um, estradiol has similar properties similar to atypical antipsychotic drugs. And there, there's um, you know a f- pretty strong theory that a lot of serious mental illnesses, particularly schizophrenia, um, have a significant uh, hormonal component um, and um, uh, sp- specifically uh, low estrogen levels. Um, estrogen influences dopamine, serotonin, and glutamine. Um, it leads to the production of uh, the testosterone, DHEA, so your androgens, progesterone, and it's a negative feedback for pregnenolone. Estradiol supplementation increases HDL cholesterol. So if you got somebody with a cholesterol of uh, HDL cholesterol of 36 and it's not going anywhere, adding uh, estradiol 
um, will increase their um, HDL levels. Um, estrogen enhancers over the counter uh, include cruciferous vegetables. Now you need to be careful with cruciferous vegetables because they, they are a detriment to patients with thyroid issues. So um, cruciferous vegetables for low estrogen, good. Cruciferous vegetables for, lo for, for uh, thy low thyroid is bad. Um, it slows the thyroid down even more. Um, again, high intensity interval exercise, um, uh, flaxseed oil, soy, uh, the bro your broccoli derivatives, particularly sulforaphane and, and uh, DIM, um, black cohosh and chaseberry usually come together uh, in, in supplements and they will uh, improve uh, estrogen levels. Don Kwai is a Chinese herb. Maca, again, like we saw with testosterone. Boron, again, will lower uh, sex hormone binding globulin and DHEA. Um, for estrogen dominance, um, uh, this is a sort of a treatment protocol. In patients that are cycling, um, progesterone uh, on days 14 through 25. Um, if it's if it's mild, we can use a cream, two to 5%. I, like I said, I've seen it up to 7.5% over the counter. Oral progesterone, and these are prescriptions. You want to use the progesterone um, uh, you know, the um, the Prometrium natural progesterones, never use the synthetics, 100 and 200 milligrams. Serenol made by Bonafide Health is a uh, Swedish uh, a pollen, and it, it, it that will mimic progesterone. You want to try to avoid endocrine disruptors, so, you know, plastics and, and, and such. Um, an anti-inflammatory diet, paleo diet, um, a gluten-free diet, um, make sure they get enough exercise. Green tea extract, will uh, will um, uh, improve the estrogen uh, uh, picture. And your aromatase inhibitors uh, over the counter are um, uh, quercetin, grapeseed extract, licorice, re and resveratrol. Um, we have used um, anastrozole one milligram a day in, in females with uh, fibroids, and we have decreased their size um, and saved them surgery, at least temporarily. Again, resveratrol, uh, cruciferous vegetables, curcumin, um, and moderate uh, alcohol and caffeine and evening primrose oil. Progesterone is the cleanup uh, hitter. So estrogen is the wild haired, uh, Ralph Cramden, those of you old enough to remember Ralph, he was always looking for a get rich, get rich quick scheme that always came back to bite him. And he was always getting himself in trouble. And his, his poor suffering wife, Alice, um, was, was always um, getting him out of trouble. So estrogen is our Ralph. Uh, getting into trouble, and progesterone is is our savior, is Alice. Uh, progesterone is the second is the predominant in the second half of your cycle. Um, it's analogous to the behind the scenes political operative, um, like I just said. Estrogen uh, estrogen excess causes cysts, um, uterine cysts, which we call uterine uh, cysts. We call fibroids, ovarian cysts, breast cysts, breast tumors, uh, fibrocystic breast disease, headaches, moodiness, and gallstones. Patients that have gallstones invariably, uh, females invariably have estrogen excess and PMS also. Uh, progesterone is your friend. Remember, you need to use the natural progesterone, not the synthetic. It balances estrogen, it improves sleep, it has a natural calming effect, it lowers high blood pressure, it helps the body use and eliminate fats, it increases scalp hair, it increases the metabolic rate, it's a natural diuretic. Um, it's a natural antidepressant and anti-inflammatory. Um, progesterone deficiency to symptoms are agitation, irritability, can't sleep or libido, headaches, short-tempered, um, bone pain, and insomnia. Um, with uh, traumatic brain injury, tro progesterone protects um, uh, nerves from oxidative stress. It reduces age-related myelin loss and peripheral nerves. It will take a good six months to see, see a change. It promotes neurodegeneration, regenerates myelin as any anxiety, any depressive, any aggression, any stress, and any convulsant. Low progesterone levels are, 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 are noted in the frontal brain in Parkinson's disease. It attenuates um, a, a, a quite a number of cytokines, including interleukins 1b, 6, TNF-alpha, NF-kappa-beta, Toll receptors 2, COMPS 3, and 5. So it's anti-inflammatory. Progesterone is your friend. Uh, progesterone also uh, will drive your body to make allopregnenolone, which is the uh, hormone that 
um, stimulate stimulates uh, the production of GABA, your calming neurotransmitter. That's why it's it's sedative. Um, a, a brief segue into five alpha reductase inhibitors. So testosterone converts to dihydrotestosterone via five alpha reductase inhibitors. Um, many of you might know that you know using five alpha reductase in, uh, inhibitors in, 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 uh, inhibitors um, can cause um, quite severe um, uh, uh, psychiatric uh, problems in, uh, up to and including suicide in a select number of patients. About one to three percent of the patients have some sort of uh, mental um, uh, derangement due to uh, using the five alpha reductase inhibitors. And it seems to be the younger men who use the one milligram um, uh, Propecia versus the five milligram and the older guys for prostate issues. For some reason, it, it, it's targeted towards them where they have these, these uh, uh, sexual issues and uh, mental issues, and they end up with um, um, uh, testosterone um, uh, replacement uh, necessary. Um, and the mental issues are, uh, <clears throat> come about because, um, again, progesterone converts to 5-alpha dihydroprogesterone, same as testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. And then it, it, that uh, converts into allopregnenolone, which which makes our uh, that calming neurotransmitter, GABA, um, via the same um, uh, enzyme, 5-alpha reductase. So, uh, you know, what was forgotten is if you're going to use 5-alpha reductase inhibitors here, it's going to end up in the brain also, and you're going to end up with issues there. So patients that are, are have a uh, tendency to depression, history of depression, um, anxiety, uh, you know, behavioral issues, they really should not be given those 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. This is pretty much all what I told you before. Um, and um, this is just a um, schematic of it. Um, uh, progesterone uh, will um, you'll end up with um, a decreased GABA, decreased allopregnenolone, and issues with memory loss, slowed thought, processes, um, impaired problem solving, decreased comprehension, anxiety, depression, suicide ideation. Not great in a um, in a in a 25 year old who was trying to keep his hair from falling out. These are the um, uh, remedies for uh, progesterone without progesterone. So number one is saffron, 30 milligrams a day. Um, uh, these are over the counter. We'll get a 32% reduction in depressive symptoms. It decreases cortisol. Vitamin B6 will decrease prolactin, estradiol, and increase progesterone. Um, you'll find it in you know, these foods here. Um, chaseberry and uh, black cohosh will reduce uh, prolactin and stimulate progesterone. Green tea extract reduces a luteinizing hormone, estradiol, 16-hydroxyestrone, um, and increases progesterone. Zinc in a lower dose than for testosterone, 15 to 30 milligrams. The Swedish bee pollen, which is, um, we, I mentioned it before, before is called serenol. Um, it contains royal jelly and uh, chromium, uh, so it'll improve uh, blood sugar and, and, pro and progesterone. Arginine is a nitric oxide donor, which increases uh, corpus luteum blood flow by about 100%. Vitamins E and C um, are also um, uh, 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 other ways to uh, raise testosterone, uh, progesterone levels without using progesterone. Here's the references for all of those. If you want to lower progesterone for whatever reason, usually that, that's not the issue. Um, it's usually um, it, it, to lower progesterone as we've been supplementing progesterone in whatever manner, and we sort of over overshot the mark. But increasing fiber will get increased, decreased progesterone by 14%. Exercise, smoking, um, uh, vitamin D, uh, reduce stress and refer to the estrogen boosters. Okay, thyroid, um, as you know, is the little gland in the, in the Adam's apple, um, and it, it creates uh, chemicals that carry messages from its origin to specific uh, 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 distal organs. Um, so uh, thyroid dysfunction uh, comes about for two reasons. One is hereditary, which it used to be that's pretty much the way it was. Um, now we've sort of uh, polluted the world with uh, 100,000 chemicals in the last 50 or 60 years, and we see a lot of autoimmune issues. You have to ask for it or you're not going to find it, though. 98% um, of the time, if a patient comes in with a thyroid issue, it's going to be hypothyroid. Symptoms will be dry skin, dry hair, fingernails crack and break, constipation, can't lose weight, cold all the time, tired all day long. It's the direct opposite for hyperthyroidism. You can get hair loss there. 
um, but it's um, the hair is oily, greasy. Um, you get bulging eyes. Um, you get an enlarged goiter, uh, difficulty sleeping, irritability, palpitations, diarrhea, weight loss, and soft nails. Um, the patients um, with hypothyroidism, the outer third of the eyebrow will, will thin out. Um, and I didn't tell you, forgot to tell you, the middle third of the eyebrow uh, it reflects growth hormone and the inner third, um, depending on the patient's sex, uh, was the sex hormone. So for, for males, it's testosterone. For females, it's estrogen. Um, these are the labs um, that you would want. You'd want to uh, let me see if I skip something here. No. Okay. So these are the labs that we want to want to draw for um, thyroid. Uh, it's more than TSH. You need a free T3, T, free T4, reverse T3, 25 hydroxy vitamin D, uh, TPO and antithyroid uh, globulin, uh, B12 folic acid, and ferritin. You need all of those. And make sure you get the um, the um, the thyroid antibodies. About a third of the patients that I see, I see a skewed population, come into my office, new patients uh, with a thyroid problem that they don't know about, and more than half of them have uh, positive immune antibodies um, that they don't know about. And the, the uh, remedies are much different for uh, straightforward thyroid issues versus um, those that have the immune issue. Uh, the endocrinologists, for the most part, at least around here, tell them there's nothing you can do about it, and that's not true. These are the lab values that we look at. Our goal for TSH is 0.8 to 2.0. We want the free T3. That's the part that does the work in the upper third of uh, the normal range. Normal is 2.0 to 4.2. So we want a 3.4, 3.6, 3.8 to 4.2. The reverse T3 is that inert T3. Uh, we use this as a proxy for cortisol or a stress hormone, and it saves us a lot of money. Um, uh, you know, we used to do on, on everybody the, the the four point saliva test. I know that's pretty standard. Um, this is about ninety percent um, uh, correlates with it. And uh, as long as we get the reverse T three under fifteen, the patient's uh, cortisol level should be pretty well controlled. Uh, we can do a a uh, free T three to reverse T three ratio, and you want that to be um, depending if you use uh, free T three times. We do it by ten now, so so at two point oh, we want it over two point oh. Um, if you do it by 100, like I show you here, then it's uh, 20. Uh, TPO, um, so the thyroid antibodies, this is the value for uh, uh, the hospitals are in, in the Reno area and Quest. For LabCorp, it'll say 34. Um, and uh, the anti thyroid antibodies is less than one. Vitamin B levels, you want in the upper third of the um, of normal, some labs will sell you 200 to 1200. So you want it about seven to 800 at least. And ferritin levels as an iron store, you're gonna see low ferritin levels with the autoimmune issues. And so we wanna replace that. Vitamin D, we want it at, you know, 30 to 100 is normal, 50 to 80 is our sweet spot or up and up to 100. You don't want too much vitamin D. What could go wrong again, for the most part, it used to be mom, dad, you know, hereditary back to your Adam and Eve. And now we see molecular mimicry and we see things like in, in, you know, inflammatory foods, heavy metal toxicity, uh, mold toxicity, infectious diseases, including herpes, um, Lyme disease, uh, H. pylori, uh, 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 Yersinia, which is um, uh, uh, gastroenteritis, and, and Epstein-Barr virus, which, and, which is the, the most, the most the least, the common of them all. And so these kids get a mono in the, in, when they're in high school, and 10 years later, they end up with these autoimmune issues. Um, the HPA excess insufficiency, cortisol excess or deficiency, uh, molecular mimicry, fluoride. So, so in, the, in the late 40s, um, you know, the, again, us genius doctors decided that iodine was a poison, and we had it taken out of the food supply. And at the same time, uh, another genius um, group decided that fluoride should be put in the water to protect against teeth. Well, iodine and fluoride are, are similar chemically, and our brains weren't able to, to discern, discern them for a while until the, the cavalry comes out. It takes, takes took about five years. Um, there was Hashimoto's thyroid uh, crisis in uh, many major U.S. cities um, uh, due to the fact that we were using fluoride, which is chemically similar to iodine. But then the, you know, our brains realized that it wasn't the, the, right, the right thing, and and it it, it, uh, it we we had a, a major crisis on, on our hands. So you know, politicians, of course, who who, who were spearheaded this, you know, they're never wrong. 
and they, they, they could never admit they were wrong. So instead of, uh, you know, just reversing course, um, they got together and decided that uh, what Americans eat too much are, are salt and sugar. So they picked salt to, and they iodinized, put iodine in salt. That's where ionized salt came from um, uh, to put iodine back into the food supply. Um, and that's, so that's where it came from. There was a movie in 1964 called um, Dr. Love. It had Peter Sellers was the star. He played seven roles. Um, and um, you, you always see a, a, a those of us who remember that one, that movie, the, um, the the trailer for it was uh, Slim Pickens riding a, 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 an atomic bomb uh, down over Russia. Uh, but the backstory was that a, 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 a Air Force uh, general decided that the, the Soviets were remember, remember, this is 1964, um, were. Um, they were the ones behind the the Hashimoto's thyroiditis crisis, uh, taking the iodine out of the food supply and and putting fluoride in and in, enfeebling um, you know American youth so that they could march into the United States without firing a shot. That was the backstory on on, on that movie. Um, medications include amiodarone, beta blockers, dilantin, prednisone, um, synthetic ester progesterones, not natural ester progesterones, but synthetic ones, um, birth control pills, and lithium. Uh, will all all um, uh, affect um, the thyroid. Um, amiodarone, particularly, it's a great drug for atrial fibrillation intravenously. It's a lousy drug orally, and you know, at least at least back in Northeast Pennsylvania, where I came from, the cardiologists all insisted that patients, after uh, you know they they when they released them from the hospital with a, after an atrial fibrillation um, uh, episode. They, they had to be on amiodarone. That was the only thing they would give them. And the patients that had thyroid disease had all sorts of issues with it. I actually had one of my uh, uh, practice partners. Um, uh, he was in his early 70s, and he had, that's happened to him. He'd go to the hospital. They'd give him the amiodarone. He'd take, they'd take it home. Two weeks later, he'd, be, he'd, he'd have a thyroid crisis over it. And I called the cardiologist and said, look, you can't give this to this guy. You know, it, it was like talking to a wall. So anyway. Traumatic brain injuries in thyroid, 10 to 30% of the traumatic brain injury patients develop hypothyroidism, thyroid function in depression. Um, you, you get a, a, a normal or even an increase in T3, T4, 25% above the reference range, but a decrease in T3. Remember, T4 is the store unit. T3 is the part that does the work. And you get an increase in that reverse T3 or that inert T3. We want the, the T3 to reverse T3 ratio to be about, le it should be a, a less than or greater than 2.0. Um, and you get with um, thyroid, um, uh, with traumatic brain injuries, like an increase in cortisol, which will also affect the thyroid. Um, the the T3, T4. Dr. Dr. Uh, William, let's say you have a patient is is taking amiodarone because he has arrhythmia. What mm -hmm. will be the replacement here? I mean, you can advise he's not taking because well, like I mean, what else would you use for atrial fibrillation? I mean, you know, you can use um, you know, beta blockers. You can use. Uh, I, I'm I'm not even up on what what's used anymore. So anybody out there know you know knows, but but amiodarone is made from from pig thyroid. I mean, that's you know, so uh, you know, you're giving somebody with with thyroid issues. Uh, you know, you you you're giving them an, actually an 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 antagonist. So um, they just need to stay away from that. You know, acutely if they come in and There's... yes. There's actually some new evidence coming out that um, the rate control is better than rhythm control agents in AFib. So in the next few years, that might be changing, like how much we use things mm -hmm. like defetilide, amiodarone, and all of that. Okay. Okay. So... Um, we do better with the T3, T4 combinations. There's only two commercial ones left, uh, NP Thyroid and Armor. We really like Nature Throid, and we can't get that anymore. Uh, the reason that we like that is because it had calcitonin in it and magnesium, which the thyroid does produce. Um, so you need to you need to you know uh, supplement those. Um, levothyroxine has none of those things, and the endocrinologists don't seem to care. So. Um, so for whatever, okay, we get an improved weight loss, and these these there are studies, and I I have the references in here somewhere. Uh, improved weight loss, overall sense of well being, a better cognition and functionality with um, the T three T four combos, with mild trauma, uh, 
<clears throat> traumatic brain injury, total T3 levels are inversely associated with cognitive performance across all uh, levels. Uh, those with relatively high total uh, T3 levels showed little memory impairment, and those with uh, low T3 levels, um, you know, were cognitively impaired uh, quite by quite a bit. Um, psychosis, um, it, it, there's influence, thyroid influences, dopamine, serotonin, uh, glut glutamine, and um, GABA. Um, thyroid acts as a fine tuning mechanism for the neural networks. Um, this is just a model of, of, of uh, sort of a summary of what we do. Uh, over in the yellow is sort of the conventional model. Um, so the etiology of you know, failure to convert T4 to T3. Over on the right and in the, in the purple is what we look at. You need to look at all of these issues. Um, the diagnosis, um, you know, the, the, they'll do a TSH. Maybe they'll reflex to a T4. We need all of that information over on the right. Secondary diagnosis, uh, uh, especially patients with um, thyroid antibodies, uh, have a, a high incidence of GI uh, dysfunction um, and um, uh, heavy metal um, um, dysfunction, mold uh, issues, viral bacterial uh, uh, infections. Uh, and so we need to do, you know, you need to do the complete workup. Um, the remedies, you know, for in the conventional model, it's levothyroxine or nothing. Um, we like the T3, T4 combinations. Uh, we like plant sterolins if they have antibody issues and low-dose naltrexone we use quite a bit also. Diet, you know, I, I don't know if it's changed at all, but mostly I hear, I've heard from the conventional world, it doesn't matter. Um, in, in, in our world, um, a gluten-free diet is really imperative and it's not a little bit, it's, it's, it's a Judge Judy deal. They're either doing it or they're not. It's a yes or a no. Um, low goiter gen diet, um, and again, we can do a whole thyroid um, you know, lecture if you want a 1.0 there. I'm just trying to give you an overview. This is just a summary of the, um, the hormones that we look at. The doses are under each, each hormone. The functions of them are in the center. And over on the right, there are symptoms, the deficiency symptoms. So you don't have to spend five years studying this like I did. It's all right here. And there's the rest of them. Cortisol, stress hormone. How are we doing on time, Dr. Halasa? You doing okay? Are we yeah, good? It's, uh, it's like 10, to, it's uh, 8.54. Okay, we're doing good here. Keep going. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cortisol, stress hormone, um, is produced in the adrenal glands. This is your fight or flight. Um, these are your circadian rhythms. Uh, it stimulates glucose and glycogen turnover. It aids in fat metabolism. It reduces bone formation, decreases amino acid uptake, increases sodium and water retention. It's an insulin antagonist. It's in, it suppresses the immune system and it has effects on fertility. Um, cortisol will either be very high or very low in um, it, depending on, on, the, on the damage with the traumatic brain injuries. Consequences of elevated cortisol levels. This is what we mostly see with traumatic brain injury. So irritability, sugar cravings, confusion, um, uh, memory's not as sharp, uh, increase in cholesterol, triglycerides, blood sugars, uh, high fat food cravings, salty food cravings, intolerant of potassium related foods, um, increased insulin resistance, thinning skin, weight gain around the middle, um, sleep disturbance, and an impaired hepatic conversion of T4 to T3. So it's it's closely related to thyroid dysfunction, but it's a little bit different. Uh, one of the main uh, uh, issues is the fatigue pattern it, with thyroid. If it's purely a thyroid issue, the fatigue patients are fatigued. Uh, pretty much all day long, and it's a, a constant fatigue. With cortisol abnormalities, the fatigue comes and goes. They're fatigued when they wake up in the morning, then they get a little bit of a wind, then it, it falls off again mid-morning between like 10 and 11 a.m. They need something to keep them going. Um, it picks up again you know, with meals, and then it falls off again in mid-afternoon. Uh, by dinner time, they're usually exhausted. But one of the hallmarks is later at night, eight not eight o'clock, nine o'clock, ten o'clock, they get a second wind, and they're, then they're wide awake, and they have this is when they do their best thinking, their best work, um, and but then they have trouble sleeping, and there's usually salt and sugar cravings with, with that goes along with it also. Low cortisol levels, you're going to have allergies, you're going to have an unresponsive hypothyroid symptom, you're going to have um, a, a, emotional I issues, uh, not able to get out of their own way, poor wound healing. Uh, fatigue or stamina issues, low blood pressure, light sensitivity, digestive issues, hypoglycemia, and libido issues. Um, now, adrenal fatigue, 
Uh, so, you know, the endocrinologists tell us there's only a, uh, Addison's disease or um, here's my here's my uh, old timers kicking. What's what's the high too too high cortisol? Um, not Sjogren's. Somebody help me out here. What, what's what's excess cortisol? Anyway, I'll look it up later. Um, adrenal fatigue is Mister In Between. So again, you know, you know, the purists say there's no there's no in between. It's either a yes or a no. You mean Cushing syndrome? Is that what you mean? Yeah, that's it. Cushing's. That's that's right. <laughs> this is my my old timers kicking in, Doctor Halasa. <laughs> so, uh, um, so again, adrenal fatigue is in between. It's not, frankly, Cushing's disease. It's not, frankly, Addison's disease, but they have symptoms of both. So this is what we've, we've decided and we called the um, um, uh, adrenal fatigue. Um, usually stress is, is, is an issue, environmental toxins, pollutions, lack of sleep, poor diet, um, over-exercising can do it also. Um, again, there's the functions of cortisol. We gave you that. Um, it, with in, in traumatic brain injury, you get an increase in cortisol releasing hormone, which an increase in uh, ACTH and a, a stimulation of cortisol levels. You'll get a decrease in LH and TSH. You'll get an increased production of reverse T3 uh, from T4 with a corresponding decrease in free T3. We use that reverse T3 as our proxy for that four point saliva test. That test costs about $250. A reverse T3 costs about $10. And we can get that in our blood test. If we need the, the saliva test, we'll do it. But um, I used to do it on every patient. I, I don't do five a year now. Um, and But if you don't correct the cortisol levels, uh, the, the uh, T3 production is going to be impaired. Um, the cortisol levels and symptom severity is due to the augmenting effects of cortisol and dopamine. Elevated dopamine will increase your symptoms of anxiety and panic. Um, and that's, again, uh, decreased prolactin levels uh, signal um, uh, dopamine uh, uh, um, uh, uh, excess. 15% um, of the moderate to severe traumatic brain injuries develop primary or secondary adrenal um, fatigue with, with or failure within seven to 60 days, so within one week to two months. And DHEA is actually an active antagonist of, of cortisol. So um, low cortisol levels um, it will have, uh, uh, you can improve with DHEA. Um, high cortisol levels um, will um, will you'll end up with um, um, a, 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 a lessening of depression. Physical diagnosis: postural hypotension. Uh, patient, have the patient drink uh, eight ounces of water a half hour before the test. Have them lie down for five minutes, measure their blood pressure, um, and then and then measure their blood pressure uh, standing. Um, the, blood, the systolic should increase by 10 to 20 mil millimeters. The diastolic should decrease by about 10 millimeters. If, it, if they fall, that's an indication of adrenal fatigue. Uh, you can look at the pupils, um, an inability to hold a contraction when a light is shown across but not in the eye. So run the light across their eye. Normally, the pupil should contract for about 20 seconds. If the pupil wavers or dilates, that's another indication of uh, adrenal fatigue. The one that's most... Uh, most uh, reliable is the sergeant's white line. Um, this is a line you draw it from the pubic bone to the umbilicus with a blunt instrument. I usually use the back of a, a percussion hammer. Um, and the line, it, you know, that line, when you do that, should turn red, it, but it will remain white for minutes and minutes and minutes with a, um, on a, um, a positive a patient with a adrenal fatigue. Um, again, a little obesity is part of it. So waist to hip ratio, uh, less greater than 0 0.9 in males, 0 0.85 in females. Rogue off sign is pain or tenderness when you press over the adrenal glands on the back. Paradiagnosis, if you know that, anybody knows what that is, that's um, pain and pressure around, around the umbilicus. You, you draw a line at four and eight o'clock from the umbilicus, um, you'll fall into a hole um, and, and um, put uh, pressure there. If there's pain and pressure when you when you, you press those points, um, that's that's again another indication of adrenal fatigue. Um, and in, and in, it, this is in Japanese acupuncture, a rapid pulse which is greater than 90 beats per minute, um, and, and a slow thready pulse. And then the the thing that you can do is if you take the patient's left arm, palm up. Put your hand over the, I don't know if you can see this, at right at the elbow crease uh, where the the where the pinky of the fifth 
the fifth finger falls right in there. If you press on that um, and you get a tenderness or pain, that's a, a indica another indication of adrenal fatigue. So we got all of those signs. Laboratory diagnosis, like I said, I like reverse T3. We deal with the DHEA to cortisol ratios and the HPA saliva stress index. So the, those, those graphs. Um, reverse T3, again, 90% of the time is either an excess or deficiency in cortisol. You can get it with uh, beta blockers, uh, diabetes, um, and, and your, your intermittent fasting um, and, and or chronic inflammation, but it's pretty, it's pretty diagnostic. Uh, reverse T3, um, um, off, normal, if you, when you get a lab test, it will usually tell you about eight or nine to about 25 is normal. We'll start seeing symptoms when it's over 15. Uh, if you do a free T3 to reverse T3 ratio of uh, 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 20, or if, if you use a, a 100 as a um, as a multiplier, if you use 10, we've been using 10, so 2.0. So you want the free T3 to reverse T3 ratio to be greater than 2.0. Um, treatment protocol, um, you can look at you know these four sort of uh, pieces of the pie. So first is lifestyle changes, uh, anti-inflammatory diet, stress reduction techniques, um, secondly, the, the adaptogenic herbs. The main ones are ashwagandha, rhodiola, and cordyceps. Lots of companies, supplement companies make it they, with lots of different combinations, but you really need those three um, as, as sort of the core. I, I don't really care what which, which companies you use as long as you know they're, they're the better quality companies. Eleuthero, uh, licorice, and maca are, are next. Um, adrenal extracts, um, uh, usually about six six to eight months down the line if the patients aren't aren't improving. And then lastly, we can use Cortef. And again, remember when I first uh, showed you 20 to 30 milligrams of Cortef, we make a, a hydrocortisone a day um, to Cortef. So you're usually safe if you keep the patient under 30 milligrams a day of hydrocortisone. You usually shouldn't see side effects from it. And we usually start at, um, so Cortef comes in hydrocortisone, five milligram tablets, so usually uh, one and a half tablets in the a.m., five at noon, or one, one, milligram, or one tablet at noon and a half tablet at before six o'clock. Usually we don't dose it after six o'clock. If they forget about it, we just tell them to pick it up the next day um, because it'll keep them awake. And usually less than 30 milligrams of hydrocortisone, we should have minimal side effects. Pregnenolone is the hormone of memory. Um, it correlates with cognitive function um, and it's improved with its replacement. Uh, our lab values, our sweet spots, about 90 to 110. Sometimes you'll have patients with low pregnenolone levels. They, they'll tell you their memories are okay. I usually, when, when we go over that, this is actually part of our, our routine, um, our, our, our intake. And um, I, I'll ask them how their memory is uh, before I tell them what, what the lab value means. Um, it increases acetylcholine in the uh, amygdala, cerebral cortex, and hypo, hippocampus. Um, and uh, we get a, a, um, a, a reduction in neurotransmission with, the, with potential clinical impact on anxiety, panic attacks, agitation, uh, aggression, and, and insomnia, um, and, um, uh, and social phobias with low pregnenolone levels. Um, you, there's this so-called pregnenolone steel syndrome. Well, I think uh, I, I've been hearing uh, that, you know, that this is not such a thing anymore. Um, so you get a chronic fatigue and adrenal insufficiency. And so, you know, cortisol is, is necessary for, uh, for survival. So the pregnenolone will be shunted over to uh, cortisol if cortisol levels are low to make, maintain an adequate uh, 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 cortisol level. Um, pregnenolone is normal. Uh, when it's, when it's normal elevated, DHEA is usually low to low normal. You'll see that um, uh, pregnenolone uh, to DHEA will be low to low normal with the pregnenolone steel syndrome. Um, if stressed, the body uses um, pregnenolone to make cortisol. It also uses DHEA to make cortisol. So cortisol levels will can, can be um, decreased by, again, this, um, or rather pregnenolone levels are, are decreased by um, statins. The, is pregnenolone steel syndrome and the rapid progression or conversion to cort to cortisol. Um, uh, this was um, Olivia. This was her her the, the girl with the the volleyball gal, um, and she had a, a pregnenolone level of one hundred and thirty one. Remember, ninety to one hundred and ten is our sweet spot. Her, this was her progesterone, and you can see her cortisol level is quite low, um, and um, 
uh, free testosterone is also uh, quite low and her DHEA was quite low. Um, so um, again, so we want, again, our goal is balancing. Um, antidepressant uh, DHEA, it was uh, um, approved in 1952 by the FDA um, as, an, as, a, as an antidepressant, particularly for um, a bipolar depression. It's a mood regulator. It builds energy and confidence. It's an improved sense of well-being. If there's too much to remember from what we've been going over, just consider DHEA as sort of a mini testosterone. So whatever testosterone does, DHEA will do, but in, in, in bite-sized chunks. It will improve bone density. It is an antagonist for cortisol. So cortisol levels are high. Um, the uh, it, DHEA levels are usually low. Uh, we use DHEA, and when it, you, you can actually rever reverse that that ratio. It improves insulin sensitivity. It supports the immune system. It improves myelin sheaths. Um, it stimulates oligodendrocytes to make myelin. It protects the heart from ischemic heart issues. It decreases cholesterol formation of fatty deposits, blood clots, and it increases bone growth. Promotes weight loss increases brain function, lean body mass, sense of well-being, it helps one deal with stress, decreases allergic reactions, it decreases triglycerides. Prolactin um, diminishes uh, LH production and release, it lowers testosterone and, and causes an elevation of uh, hypothalamic dysregulation and adenoma with elevated prolactin. Low prolactin levels are is caused by an elevation of dopamine and we get at agitation, irritability, aggressiveness, anxiety, and panics. Low prolactin levels, when we measure them, is, is, is defined as less than 6.0. 33% of the patients have, uh, uh, TBI patients have abnormal prolactin levels three months post-injury, and a major uh, side effect of antidepressant therapy is abnormal prolactin levels. Low prolactin equals treatment-resistant anxiety and or depression. We went through that already. Uh, uh, here, I got this again. I think I overlapped. And I think that should be it for part two. Are we good or you want to keep going? Is, is dopamine, uh, dopamine increase prolactin or inhibit? Are um, you with me? Yep. Because when we give antipsychotic for the patient, which is lowering dopamine, the prolactin goes up. Increased dopamine suppresses prolactin inhibiting factor, so that dopamine would go up. Yes. So dopamine increases prolactin, right? No, no, dopamine inhibits the prolactin. Correct. Right. Okay. So there's an inverse relationship between them. Right. <clears throat> well, presentation was great. I mean, uh, you nail it. Uh, we just need to find out um, the putting together products. Um, so that will be more applicable because, you know, the cost of doing all of this and separate tablets, it's going to be cost for the patient. So how we can, well, we, we can do up with yeah, I mean, we formulas, can, the complete yeah. lab, we can do the complete labs for $539 from the cash lab that we deal with. Um, it's not cheap, but it's not that terrible. Um, uh, you know, that's our, uh. You know that's that's a uh, 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 lab, which is Quest sort of uh, 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 you know uh, you know not insurance issue. Uh, you know if you hand a patient a, a lab slip and they go over to the hospital lab or to to LabCorp or Quest, the, the bill will be three thousand dollars for that. So okay, so I'm it, not talking about the lab. Okay. I'm talking about supplements. It's a lot uh, of giving to the patients. Yeah, well, uh, remember that needs to be structured in a way that it will be uh, affordable, or maybe combining those ingredients in one capsule, so that it has some indication. Um, you know, because putting it in, in 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 a category there. You got my point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm not so sure we're going to be able to find one pill that's going to make take care of all of this, but um, at least one or two. You know, it just has to be a reasonable way of of uh, it depends on the patient case, but we need to come up with protocols that is financially reasonable for the patients. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I mean, you present it, and it's 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 great and everything, but we need to translate it from theory into practical. How we can turn it into products. 
And, you know, you can create, you, you, I mean, you have your own medicine right now. I can see that nobody's yeah, we, we, doing we, what you're doing. We, this we, is like complete uh, um, a new medicine for, for, for doctors. I mean, especially for cases being failed by the mainstream medicine. Uh, but in that, you need to create the protocols um, and it needs to be structured and they need to have some sort of logarithm there. Okay. Well, um, you got my point or no? I, I know. I know what you're saying. Yeah. I'm I, complimenting you. I'm trying oh, just to. Oh, I just because I, it's too the, much information and it needs to be breaking down, where it will be uh, understood by the doctors and also practical in a way that the companies can benefit. I mean, you can create a complete new field of medicine that when the mainstream medicine protocols fail, they will come to you because this will filling up all the gaps that the mainstream medicine is, is failing in. Well, you know, you, you can put together a, a you know, an anti-inflammatory capsule that has a uh, quercetin and nettle and, uh, and um, uh, uh, glutathione, you know, a, a liposomal glutathione or N-acetylcysteine, um, you know, that, that certainly can be done. Um, I'm talking about the hormonal, the hormonal way, a lot, those growth hormones and all that and how it's going to be, Practically, is it under but, supplement, under compounding pharmacy, yeah. legality of it? It's many things. Regulations. For the, mo for the most part, the you know the pills, the pills are an, an issue because the uh, you know passing through the 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 intestinal barriers and and the liver, um, and uh, we we run into r real problems with them with the hormones. So most. What about in doing it intranasal, combining all those and putting it intranasal? Yeah, I'm not that smart. You're gonna have to ask Mike Beamer that. <laughs> that's not my, that's, well, that's well. That's the reason why here and Mike is here is to really translate those information into a practical pro formulations and products and um and and so we can create this new field of medicine. I think it it fits very well with chronic disease prevention management, but especially with the hormone side, you're you're the wisdom hormones. I mean, nobody can beat you in that. <clears throat> Um, and you know, those growth hormones and all different part of it, which is many of them, but, uh, I think that's what we need. We just need to, uh, have Mike Beamer as a pharmacist to, uh, put those into products. Is that possible, Mike? Well, it kind of depends. We talked about a lot of different things. So, I mean, it would, we'd have to go pro, you know, um, yeah, a lot of th times you can do some combinations of things, of course. But um, yeah, I don't, I mean, obviously you're not going to come up with one protocol for all of these types of treatments. There's a lot of things going on here because right. we cover growth hormone, we cover testosterone, we cover thyroid. So, uh, and this all is as it relates to traumatic brain disease, I get that, but that's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of ground covered there. So no, I don't think it's just one product could do anything like that. I've, I've got um, something to add just from my experience, because I have a lot of, uh, 30, I would say on average, a lot of 30 year old patients, male patients with testosterone insufficiency. And um, what I'm finding is, and clomiphene is a really good choice. And, uh, and like I said before, it, given the choice between in, in clomiphene and, uh, and the, the clomid, um, probably just, it, it's getting more popular, I would say with, with the, the 30 year olds, 40 year olds, um, in clomiphene, but in general, uh, what I've been reading is that the, what, what's happening um, is that there's also a process that the, the males are producing more estrogen, and that may be the issue with the, with the clomiphene because clomiphene is increasing overall estrogen versus uh, N-clomiphene is, is increasing testosterone with it without the estrogen increase. But I'm finding it because it's, it is more simple. Um, it's more practical for, especially for the younger males, thirties, forties. Um, um, you know, there was the mention of, of the, if you want to be fertile that you want to maybe want to consider not doing the, the injectable testosterone plus, you know, you know, a lot of my patients I'm treating from a distance, and to get them to inject testosterone through a, a 25 gauge needle into their subcutaneous belly fat is not for the, um, I would say not for the uh, um, weak, weak people. They're, you know, it's scary for some faint of them. Faint of heart? Yeah, it's, exactly. Faint of heart. 
Yeah, I, I, not for the faint of heart. Thanks for, uh, yeah. So That's um, what you were searching you know, for. That, that, that's what, exactly what I was thinking of. Um, but, but that's the thing. I've, I've had to figure out the more simple way to do some of this. And I think because we've got more tools, um, we're less reliant on using the hormones as the entire anti-aging strategy, which is the root of, of anti-aging medicine. And I do know that TaylorMade... Some of these, uh, they have a cream that basically has a the testosterone, the progesterone, and the estradiol, and the estri estriol, yeah, estriol in it, and it's 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 at a uh, low sort of baseline dose, so it's not too much. Obviously, it almost fits almost everybody. Um, that's starting who's postmenopausal females that are postmenopausal um, that again you're just trying to get them going and maybe there's not quite as much intense monitoring and, and tweaking of the doses but it's a at least it's something to get on board that uh, at least something to start with that will allow simplicity of application and then some of these other I would say strategies we can use like uh, Amlexinox, KPV, um, oxytocin nasal spray, you know, when we're, because we're, you know, because of this, um, I would say this perfect storm or horrendous storm of, of inflammation of systemic inflammatory disorders, it, it shifted everything into a, a different thinking. And, and so that's why the hormones have become, on my end, um, have been sort of um, less emphasis, just something that we get on board, something that's simple. And then we're um, putting a lot of emphasis on modulating, you know, the TH17 um, mast, cell act mast cell activation, uh, trying to modulate mast cells and, um, you know, increasing AMPK, some of these newer concepts that, that we think that will increase the metabolism. Um, but that's just those are just my thoughts. Um, I, I really, uh, really learned a lot from this, this lecture and uh, appreciate this lecture. Great. Um, uh, Dr. Bill. Yeah. Actually, <clears throat> actually to uh, talk to you, Dr. Halase a little bit, I have four products that I have already formulated and the four products, one of them is Chrysan Cream. Right. Uh, I have also a progesterone chrysin combination, and I have a progesterone chrysin DHEA combination and DHEA chrysin combination. Because for me, uh, if you're giving any of these products, whether it's a DHEA or progesterone, if you don't put the uh, a blocker, an aromatase inhibitor, then that may have a tendency of going back to estrogen. Now, certainly too much of estrogen is not a good thing like you were saying. So for me, every time I would give progesterone or DHEA, I always put chrysin in it. I was grapeseed extract as well and zinc. So then I can block the aromatase naturally. And it works very nice. But actually my products, people are using them and they're very happy with it. So uh, Dr. Halasa and others who are interested in formulation, maybe uh, we can talk later and see what uh, we can come up with. There you go, Dr. Halasa. Well, Dr. Benoit and anybody, so next month at uh, AMMG, which is October 18th to 22nd in Houston, um, that's where the, uh, the, the uh, anti-estrogen uh, blocking uh, cabal is um, last time they had four lectures on don't you dare touch estrogen one one of the speakers there says he takes eight milligrams of estradiol a day this is a, a male uh, he's about 65 years old um, and and he he he, uh, he wants to see estro estrogen levels in the 150s for male males so I don't know. Yeah, actually, there's a lot of controversy about I've that. Doing, because I've, I, been, I've been doing this for 20 years. When I, I see estrogen levels over over, over 40, we see um, emotional issues. We see uh, uh, depression. We see um, uh, erectile dysfunction. And uh, when we get them down in the, you know, again, you don't want it to go to zero, 
but um, you know, when we get it down into a reasonable level, you know, those things seem to go away. So yeah, as you know, I'm uh, a little bit anti-estrogen because of the xenoestrogen. We mm -hmm. do have tons of xeno. My, majority of the pollutants that we have in the environment they mimic estrogen. So if many of us are already contaminated with these estrogens, why even add more estrogen to us? And you can see so many people with gynecomastia. I mean, you, you go to prisons, all they have is gynecomastia in those places. <laughs> I, try, I try to stay away from those places. And if I did go there, I wouldn't be looking at that. So <laughs> Right. <laughs> A lot of gynecomastia. Yeah. So I'm saying I'm naturally like people people are getting it from their diet, from uh, everything they're doing, their water, pollutants. So why even add more estrogen, especially if estrogens are not benign? Because I'm just, telling, can't... I'm just a messenger. I'm just telling oh, you. No, 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 no. I know. I'm just saying you, you're right. We should have some estrogen, but not overly uh too now, well, much of estrogen like i said this guy got up and got up in in the you know in the, in the classroom and said he he's taking seven or eight milligrams of estradiol a day and don't don't touch estrogens at all and it, if it goes somebody got up and asked him a question well what, what level's too much and uh he wouldn't answer he wouldn't give an answer so is he on the women's yes. swim team he's on the women's swim team probably uh <laughs> right <laughs> a little too old for that by now <laughs> I got a question. Yes. What is it about the prisons that you mentioned gynecomastia? What, yeah. What, what What was it? What was the question again? It was. This is for Benoit. It was oh, about okay. the prisons. Like, oh, why do oh, you yeah, see yeah. more prison, gynecomastia oh, yeah, there? Yeah, the prison. The prisons in the U.S. They have a lot of gynecomastia because of their diet. The food that they eat, they feed them a lot of carbohydrates, especially wheat products and all of that. So many of them, if you you check, they have a lot of breasts. <clears throat> Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Should we should we should we ask why you know so much about prisons and and gynecomastia? Oh yeah, I uh, <laughs> I did a little work. I did a lot of work with them. Actually, I'm doing a series. I call it the Prison Economy. Uh -huh. uh, writing a few books about that and trying to understand of the recidivism why we have so many people going in and out and the hormonal underpinning of uh, uh, addiction. Mm -hmm. So that's why I am um, interested in this. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, because I think the, the, uh, the addiction, uh, opioid addiction, uh, may stem from hormonal imbalance. And we're not looking at it as such, but if you look at the literature, there are many people who think that, uh, say, low testosterone, for instance, too much estrogen sometimes can cause addictions uh, because people get anxiety, they get depression, they have that, and then that leads them to to be uh, willing to do drugs and to do that. So I am looking into all of these and spread my little thing that I do. Okay. Um, question on the, in the chat: Clomid can be used in low T with prostate cancer. Theoretically, yes. Um, usually, we wait at least a year after they're done their treatment, and if their their PSA is less than one point um, usually we'll go ahead with that. Um, we're even using testosterone now. So, but uh, Clomid it, it uh, uh, does not affect the prostate um, in, in the same way that testosterone does. And so, yet theoretically, yes, you can use testosterone or uh, club. Um, what about what about luteinizing hormone, uh, releasing hormone, the one that can there is a nasal spray for that? Can that replace clomiphene? Um, again, theoretically, probably yes. I've never used it, so I don't know if anybody else has any experience. I just want to have. Are you, are you are you talking about uh, gonadotropin? Yeah, the one that's recognizing hormone, releasing hormone. Yeah, I believe that's gonadorelin. It's an injectable. It's uh, they have it no, in troves. There is one internasal for that. And uh, yeah, as I yeah, as I, as I was thinking that there was a uh, intranasal, but that's another one. That's another thing, <clears throat> another tool. Um, it seems that the the enclomaphene uh, might be stronger than the gonadorelin because it's 
it's releasing both FSH and LH. And, you know, part of the problem for males is, is that their sperm counts are going down and their sperm motil motility and, and FSH has uh, more to do with, with uh, the sperm. And, and so that's, that's why I've, I decided finally just to go with the, uh, uh, with the encomaphene, but it, I, I think it might not be a bad idea to consider both if if you need it, because it's kind of hard to optimize testosterone just with, um, you know, enhancing the, the LH and FSH excretion, even though it makes sense, especially in, in more severe cases or the older the male is and they're trying to not do as much testosterone, if none at all. So I like to attack it from different angles uh, because it's not easy to do it without necessarily without testosterone unless they're young. Yeah, maybe consider, like you say, I agree with you, Dr. Joseph. I see more n clomiphene now than clomiphene um, and it costs more. So it w if it's not helping more, I don't know that people would pay for it. Um, the other thing is DHEA really is important to, you know, like to be, if you give DHEA within clomiphene, you get a, I think you get a pretty good effect. So that's something that we can we can use our own ingenuity then uh, make a combination then if we wanted to yeah. go with the enclopathene we could because that's uh, that's what I like about you know because we've been doing you know amlexinox KPB um, dimethyl fumarate and NAC you know because that that the problem is and I've had this problem I've heard it from others uh, that they just have so many different supplements to take as they've been trying to figure out you know over the last few years how to you know to feel better and um most of most of the things aren't working with with what we're dealing with and you know what as we've gotten more and more targeted and you know learning the mechanisms of action of course and um, now i'm seeing how we can kind of combine some of the things to cut down the amount of uh um pills and sprays and and that's why i also like doing is is doing a spray a pill an injection having some you know not just um, a bowl full of pills. Um, but that's the problem I've seen with some patients are taking so many things that they actually get burned out from taking all the, all their medications or all their peptides and supplements. And then they just stop taking them. Right. Yeah, they right. just we stop need to all come up at with once. something yeah. affordable and a protocol. And that's what we're doing here. I mean, but you know, I can see. Well, let me, let me tell you guys about this since I, I'm going to have yeah. to go real quick. I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Klatz and I have worked up a vitamin uh, that I think we're going to try to introduce. It's got 26 different ingredients in it, and it'll handle a lot of what you're saying. We basically put everything that we can in it that will keep it in two capsules. And uh, it, yeah, it should be. I, I want all you guys to look at it and review it because I just want to see what you think. But it'll be something that'll be, you know, available hopefully pretty soon. So I'll, I'll introduce that maybe next week um, uh, when we have more time. Has anybody actually tried uh, chromaphene and uh, 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 L-arginine to see uh, in terms of sperm production and all of that? l is good, but when they get old in age, according to Dr. Brian, he said that we don't have en enough in time to convert l into... Um, Nitric oxide. That's his argument. I don't know if it's valid yeah. or not. Well, it'd be it'd be the same thing as giving Tadalafil with testosterone. Really, at the end of the day, I mean, you're just feeding a precursor for nitric oxide to the Tadalafil, and we do that. We actually have a supplement that or a, a product that has Tadalafil, arginine, citrulline, DHEA, all that kind of stuff in it, and you take it every day, and it's like a nitric oxide enhancer for ED, and, and uh, that does very well. Uh, so if anybody wants to try that, I'll send you a couple of free ones you see. <laughs> so the aromatic but, inhibitors, what is the name of them, those aromatic inhibitors, the supplement ones? Do we have big pharma products? Right, you have Chrysin and, and that kind of stuff. But the the um, the big pharma product is the Nastrozole. Nastrozole is aromatic inhibitor? Yeah, Arimidex and uh, Nitrozole, those are aromatic inhibitors. Yeah, that's about it. But, um, you know, but I'm, again, I'm thinking, you know, as we're, as things are obviously evolving, our approaches are getting more refined. I'm seeing that enclomaphene might be, you know, if that's a great place to start with, with uh, a new 
you want the male who's new with, um, you know, with the uh, hormones and because it's a estrogen antagonist, it's a partial um, estrogen antagonist of the receptor, the estrogen receptors of the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. Um, but when you, when looking in the context of male overproduction of estrogen is having a negative feedback on their LH and FSH, and by um, breaking that vicious cycle, increases that LH and FSH, and you're addressing the, the sperm and the testosterone at the same time, you know, perhaps the anastrozole is maybe not as relevant. It's well, too the problem strong, is I that think. when you are fat, obese patients, especially obese guys, okay, the, the problem is not the testosterone production, is the, is the aromatic activity is very high in the, in the fat tissue. And they're the ones converting testosterone to estrogen. That's why you see the gynecomastia in patients with, with obesity. And I think that, and most of the people are having a problem there are overweight. And I think aromatic inhibitors are, are very critical, um, especially for a VS patient who has problem with, um, with, uh, with the fertility. What do you think? Well, well I think that's I, 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 I What I think is that um, we've got two situations. We, we, have, we have a male who's morbidly obese, who's not going to, they're not going to uh, transform um, anytime soon, it's going to be, it's going to take a while. And most of their problem has to do, or they've got more of a problem of estrogen conversion versus somebody who is, who has metabolic syndrome, they're overweight, but we're addressing the, the AMPK, optimizing the AMPK through these different um, protocols, especially um, Amlexanox and KPB, that's increasing AMPK. Um, we're, we're thinking in terms of AMPK. So we know that we are moving the metabolism um, and we'll be improving uh, this, this male obesity. We'll be moving in the right direction. Meanwhile, we have a partial estrogen blocker uh, of the pituitary and, and hypothalamus going on at the same time. So because we're addressing, you know, we're looking at the bigger picture, addressing <clears throat> the, the mechanisms Maybe in that situation, the anastrozole won't be needed. Uh, but yeah, definitely the, the more more morbid obese patient, I could see how the, uh, you know, the just blocking just be a partial estrogen antagonist isn't going to be enough. And I'm, I'm imagining it, imagining that that would be the case. Oh, no, you need to work on weight loss. At the same time, giving aromatase inhibitor, it's not... Um... It's not a bad thing. I think we need it needs to be added so they can we can decrease the conversion because if you give testosterone to patient who is obese, okay, what will happen is the testosterone will convert to estrogen, and that's a problem there because then it will antagonize the effect of testosterone, and it, it will have more gynecomastia and all the all the problems of feminization. I think aromatase it's inhibitor and if there's a supplement there out there. I think it needs to be part of even part of the weight loss program for, for the male so that we can, uh, uh, because the testosterone itself, it helps to to increase the lipolysis and increase the muscle mass. And if you give the testosterone without giving aromatase inhibitor, um, the testosterone converts estrogen and that will actually, will defeat the, the purpose. Um, actually, I agree with you 100%. And that's why, I created the uh, Crisen uh, uh, grape seed extract uh, zinc cream. So then everybody who is obese or they're taking even uh, androgel uh, to try to boost up their testosterone, I give it to them because making sure that they don't convert that testosterone back to estrogen or right. because of the aromatase, uh, they don't continue making estrogen. Right, right. I think that's the opposite effect when you have a uh, female athletic and that she's uh, she doesn't have much of fat, then she doesn't she, the, the problem is that she will end up having uh, too much of testosterone um, and she will lose her feminization. Um, oh, actually, that's that why giving happen. fat issue that to, doesn't uh, happen very often though, Dr. Halasa. Actually, which, if uh, women, if you don't give them uh, an aromatase inhibitor, 
They're no, no, no. Big... Actually, it's the opposite. You don't give to athletic uh, women uh, aromatase inheritor. That will aggravate the whole thing. I mean, I'm just saying the 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 problem with female uh, when they lose their fat tissue, they lose the aromatase enzyme, and that means they will have much more testosterone because their testosterone is not converting to estrogen, and that's something that will will uh, virilize them. Uh, of course, you don't want to give those patients aromatase inhibitor. In fact, you need to give them something that will enhance the aromatation and converting testosterone into estrogen for those cases. I'm just showing you the importance of inhibiting aromatase in obese patient of male, but female um, athletics, you really need to uh, um, give her even more to enhance the aromatase activities. You got my point? Yeah. Hey, yeah, one so, thing I... I um, yeah, just one really quick point. I don't know. Who, who are you, uh, Bennett? I never <laughs> met you before, Tano. <laughs> Me? <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, uh, I have uh, done two presentations with uh, uh, Dr. Bios' group. And so... Uh -huh. we did, I never... I went, what, are, what are you? Are you a compounding pharmacy or a supplement? What are you? No, no, no. I'm actually uh, an allergist, an immunologist. I'm one of the rare allergists who does functional medicine. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Good, good. So where are you getting your products? You designing it yourself, or you have a I did, yeah yeah I design I designed it myself. Uh, well, you need to work with Mike Beamer. We have here a pharmacist, very smart, intelligent one here. Okay, all right. He's so a, he's the pharmacist can... of the group, and uh, he will work with you. Oh, that would be good, Mike. Are you there, so Mike can... Beamer? Are you left? He left. I think he left. <clears throat> right, right. I was, I was going to mention uh, about the anastrozole. Uh, I I didn't realize in the context. Uh, you were you were saying it in the context of treating a, a male with testosterone shots, right? And uh, I would absolutely one hundred percent agree. I don't like the idea of doing testosterone shots without an astrazole. Not not in this day and age. Um, and you know I, that's what uh, I, I've I've gone. I've been in both situations. I'll I'll send you the lectures and the videos from the AMMG. It'll turn your hair green. <laughs> it, it, and that's in that's a is that talking about an astrazole? Yeah, yeah, yeah especially if they want to treat uh, gynecomastia, right? And you say I'm well, going to treat gynecomastia, and I'm going to give them uh, clomidine or clomiphene, or I'm going to give them testosterone, yeah, and they are obese, and it's it's really they they are not going to treat the gynecomastia. In fact, it may uh, enhance the gynecomastia without the aromatase inhibitor. What do you think, Doctor Joseph and Doctor William? Well, um, um, I sus I suspect that there was was there controversy, Doctor Clearfield, with oh, with it, an it, it had, they had four lectures saying never use. I mean, they're very proud of never using an astrazole, never using a an, an a, you know a, an aromatase inhibitor of any kind. Um, that's, why? Why? Huh? Uh, why? It, they'll pull out a few things. Um, um, uh, uh, bone loss, uh, osteoporosis. Um, they were, they were, that that was that was a big that was a big um, uh, selling point. Thirty seven percent of men who who um, elderly men who have, have fractured hips from osteoporosis die within a year. Um, uh, that was a selling point. Um, estrogen, like I said, I, when I showed you, the estrogen will increase HDL cholesterol, um, and uh, so you you block the estrogen down. Now now I, I think they're taking it to an extreme where they're where they're saying. Um, uh, you know, you know, I think we can all all agree that you don't block the estrogen down to zero. Um, but, um, you know, they most a lot of them are, are uh, uh, you know, advocating that that you, you just let it ride. Um, and, and those were the reasons they gave. There, there's a YouTube video uh, with um, Jay Campbell and 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 Dr. Rosier about this. And I don't know if you ever heard, heard him speak. He's, a, he's They are right if you give it by itself. Right. That that may be possible that you're decreasing you're decreasing the uh, but but if you give it with testosterone, I don't, actually it's it's that you I'm are just, like I said I'm just the messenger. Um, and but I think what they yeah. had they made a study it's a monotherapy most of the time and yes if you give aromatase inhibitor by itself I think it will defeat the purpose I mean it doesn't make any sense I well, think it needs to be given with other hormones to maintain the osteo uh, to prevent osteoporosis. Well, well, if if you give uh, a aromatase inhibitor, 
um, you know, like when you were saying obese men, right? Obese men that will convert their testosterone to estrogen. So in these obese men, if you give them an aromatase inhibitor, then they, they can prevent the conversion of the testosterone to estrogen. So they don't get all the prostate cancers, prostate enlargement and all of that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's possible to do that, to help them out. Also, if you give them testosterone or even DHEA, knowing that those will convert into testosterone, you have to block the conversion of the testosterone to estrogen. So in that case, aromatase inhibitors will be also very good. So um, we can give aromatase inhibitors. I do give to women, and I have been doing this since 2007, and I haven't had any major issue with the women. Well, why are you giving it to women? Yeah, because the women also convert their testosterone. So it's not like men only who convert well, the testosterone. We need it. We need for the women to convert testosterone to estrogen. It's not a bad thing. Oh, it's a bad thing. We don't want that because a lot of women, for instance, if you give them progesterone alone, they come and tell you they could not tolerate it. They're having all kinds of reactions to it. And that's because that progesterone is going to uh, too much estrogen. And I can show you, for instance, I see a lot of women who have hives. Yeah, so basically, yes, if you give them progesterone, the progesterone turns into testosterone first. Well, I think the, what happened is that the, the women take the testosterone and turn it into estrogen, right? Right. They, they don't. They take progesterone, they turn it into testosterone, and the testosterone will turn into estrogen. They go to estrogen. That's why I put the blocker. So then they don't convert the testosterone to the estrogen. But when I do that, they don't be, get hirsutism. They don't get any kind of uh, um, male effect on it. I. I make sure that it doesn't happen. And I don't see them growing hair. I don't see them having all kinds of uh, deep voice or anything like that. And uh, you, if you put the right amount of uh, uh, aromatase inhibitor, that does not happen. So over the years, I have learned to do this and it works really nicely. When I teach uh, the A4M, I tell them that too. I say, well, for men, we give them an aromatase inhibitor whenever we give them testosterone and all of that, but women would don't do that. Why? And nobody can answer that question because it's the same process. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. No, I think this is, that, you know, it actually makes sense though, um, what, what you're saying. It's, it's um, every case is different. Um, you know, if somebody needs more of this or more of that or more blocking of estrogen, um, you're you're working with those those uh, different scenarios, and um, again, it, it kind of also too ties in a little bit where I was coming from. I think because I'm not I'm also trying to address the other issues now. Now that I'm I'm smarter thanks to doing th this group work, and I'm addressing more of the more of the other issues: the inflammation, the oxidative stress, which is leading to the obesity and leading to decreased um hormone production you know obviously there's a point where there, there are no hormones being produced and we have to address that differently but in general it seems like again the traditional approach to hormone replacement at least the advanced levels that that anti-aging medicine brought to the table with with bioidenticals that seemed to be they were addressing most of the anti-aging issues with hormones well, now we're, we're modulating all these other things. And it seems like in my experience now that I'm less reliant on, on hormones. I can be more conservative with hormones. I don't need to worry about getting the, the testosterone to 800, 900 um, units in order to, for the, this, this person who I'm treating to feel more vitality and feel more energetic because, because it's not the case. The test, that's that's always the problem. The the patients will do their research and go, oh, that's why I'm so tired. It's, it's testosterone, and then they do the testosterone and they realize that it, at least now it's not fixing all their problems. They don't feel that much difference, and so I'm relying less on testosterone. I'm moving more towards enclomethine. I'm no, I'm not having to worry or address this this um, estrogen issue um, so much. I don't I don't think. 
um, because I'm not, um, I'm being conservative with the hormones because I'm also addressing the other issues really precisely and aggressively. Okay, well, uh, one, the estrogen, I showed that, for instance, in uh, my studies and presentation, I showed that when you have too much estrogen, actually your insulin goes up. So there's a direct relationship between estrogen and insulin. So when the insulin goes up, people crave sweets, or inadvertently they eat the carbohydrates, then the blood glucose goes up and the insulin takes it and puts it into fat cells. So if we look at the mid-1990s till now, when we introduced glyphosate in our food chain through the GMOs, you can see that if you look at the obesity trends, obesity has gone up tremendously since the mid-1990s. And I attribute that to this fact that glyphosate causes the insulin to go up, leading to this obesity cycle that we have that we cannot break. So in essence, estrogens are not really benign. So we have to really address the estrogen problem to making sure that people can lose their weight. So if there are groups there who think that we should have more estrogen, more estradiol, more of this, and they don't take into account what the environment is doing, then they're not going to get results. No, that, that's excellent information. Thank you. Sure. Well, I, I think that one of the things that we're missing here is that we're, we're talking about blindly doing, a, you know, combining testosterone with other agents to block test, to block estrogens, when what we really need to be doing is testing levels and adjusting everything to testing levels. And so, you know, I, I had a, a, a personal trainer with 10% body fat that I put on even a low dose of testosterone and he developed a breast lump and, um, and other things, you know, because he doesn't have any fat on his body. He doesn't, he was converting in his liver to high levels of estradiol and, and, and needed an aromatase inhibitor. Whereas you know, we're, we're talking about blocking everyone on aromatase inhibitors. I have some patients that their estrogen levels are quite low, but we, we need to test and see before we jump to conclusions and and put everyone on the same protocol. I also used to use Chrysin in every, every transdermal product I used, and patients hated it. It didn't absorb. It left a crusty... Um, residue on their skin and and you know it was just kind of a generic thing that i did so you know a lot of times we need to you know we need to to idealize every treatment for every patient and you know not really have a generic generic protocol for everyone and you know just as we talk about the younger patient using clomiphene or um, or an agent like um, HCG for them and older patients, we can use more testosterone. It, we, we really need to be idealizing and, and checking levels and making sure that people are getting to appropriate levels. And if we don't need to block estrogen, then, you know, don't do it. But if we do and their, their estrogen levels are rising, and they're having symptoms. So we need to take into, into account multiple factors when we're treating patients, not just their symptoms. Because early on in my hormone practice, starting in 2005, I, I was treating numbers a lot. And I really learned, I really learned to, that, that I was treating women saying, no, your estrogen levels need to be higher. FSH is too high. And they're bleeding to death every month. And um, because of the high hormone levels and the high estrogen, um, trying to get it to ideal levels that we need to take into account how our patients feel as well as their hormone levels, as well as um, how they're converting, because every reaction is a chemical reaction in the body and no one's the same. So we have, we learned in chemistry, the reaction goes both ways. If we have high testosterone levels that 
the conversion to estrogen may be more likely. And that's why even with um, injectables, I have my patients take their injectables two to three times a week instead of like every two weeks or every three weeks because we're not peaking testosterone levels to push it over into estrogen. And so we, we need to take a lot of different variables into account for our patients and how how the physiology works in response to the treatment we're giving to, in medicine, first do no harm, and then, and then number two, to idealize their treatment. So... Oh, yeah. So I, 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 you know, all these things, all this information is great, but when the rubber hits the road, we're treating individuals and we're treating their specific physiology and everyone is different. I actually agree with you. And uh, that's why I personally don't give any hormones or anything without testing thoroughly. And estrogen wise, you know, uh, many people don't test even the uh, estron. So if you test the uh, E1S, which is the estron sulfate, we test the E1, which is the estron, we test the estradiol, and you test the estriol, you will see that sometimes the E1 converts into E2. So the two of them enter convert. So for in the menopausal women, they're not ovulating anymore. So therefore, the estradiol is going to be almost zero if you look at the test numbers. But in the body, perhaps that is the interconverting. So you cannot say that this woman is not making any estrogen at all. When the E1, if you test it, is very high. The other thing is many people don't test the estrogen metabolites, <clears throat> like the 2 hydroxyestrone the 16 alpha uh, uh, 16 alpha hydroxyestrone. Now, if we test the estrogen metabolites, you may find out that perhaps all the E1 is going to be 16 alpha that is predisposed them to have the cancers and everything else. And there are many people out there who say, oh, go take DIM or take uh, indoor 3 carbinol to boost uh, your good estrogen. But that also has a paradoxical effect of sometimes reducing your 2 hydroxy extreme that is protective. So unless you test, you would never know. So that's why treating the patient and treating their symptoms and also looking at the numbers makes sense. Well, let me add something here. Sometimes um, patients, if you give them hormones and then you start optimizing their health, giving them antioxidants and all the good stuff, and you decrease the free radicals and all that, especially if you start giving them loxanox and all those uh, antioxidants, the sensitivity and the production of, of those hormones will increase. And then the dose that you're giving, it can be overwhelming for them after three months or four months of optimizing their health, where you need to reduce the, those hormones. Because the beginning when they give those hormones, their estrogen receptors and testosterone receptors or receptors in general are being blocked because of the oxidative stress. And oxidative stress also decreases the release of those hormones as well. And so, um, of course, I think it has to be personalized. And also, once you start optimizing their health, um, the hormones need to be adjusted, where most of the time needs to be reduced. Otherwise, they will be overdosed with uh, when they will they will suffer from all the symptoms of, uh, of too much of it. All right. I agree. I agree. That's one of the problems with um, originally when we used to treat hormones only as far as anti-aging. I think we missed that phenomenon and we're, we're really doing high doses of hormones to make up for everything else. Um, and I agree that there's a balance with the, with hormones and optimizing all the rest of the body's functions then the hormone requirements can go down. Um, but again, back to my main principle, we need to be testing, we need to be reevaluating quite frequently with these patients so that we can optimize and not overshoot. Correct. So I, uh, one of the things that I have come up with is uh, my acronym called TORBIN. We know that it's toxic overload. We have uh, hormone imbalance. 
we have infections and we have nutrient deficiencies that are leading to the chronic diseases that we see. So if we see patients and we want to optimize their health, what do we do? We have to take out the toxins, we have to uh, obese oxidative stress, we have to uh, check their hormones and balance it properly. We have to look if they have infections that may be driving some of the problem and nutrients that they're lacking. If we replenish the nutrients and we did all of that, then they would do much better than just focusing on one aspect only. So that that is uh, the process that I have adopted and it works really nice. So I think that's what... Uh, Hello? I, I, that's what uh, Dr. Joseph, I think, was saying. And uh, I agree with all of that. I think that we should test a lot of stuff. We should optimize all the, the variables and not looking at only one aspect of it. Yeah, Dr. Tano, uh, Dr. Williams, and uh, Dr. Clearfield, uh, you guys have an enormous amount of experience, obviously, and I uh, appreciate the input. Um, Dr. Williams, I, I like that you you jumped in there and made it clear, the elephant in the room, you know, even though I know Dr. Tano, you're, you're measuring them, and Dr. Clearfield, you're measuring them. But yeah, I mean, that's an obvious answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, theoretically, we're, we make sense, but the, the lab tests, you know, they, they tell the truth. Um, so, you know, and it's not, and then like you said, if you don't only go by the labs, you, you still have to take the, how the patient's feeling, if they're, if they're bleeding still, that doesn't mean, well, the lab is, you know, doesn't, it's not high enough to, you know, well, they're bleeding. So I guess you still have to clinically reduce the, the estrogen. Um, but uh, no, these are all great points. I, I really, this is, this has been great. Okay. Well, Dr. Halasa, any any other any further questions? Um, in in, in the well, well, we need to continue your your series, but at the same time, uh, we need to look at how we can turn it into uh, formulations and uh, something that's efficient, effective. Um, but you, I mean, your presentation is great. I mean, you can create a book out of this. <laughs> we can make a book out of what you have. Uh, so yeah, keep, keep keep going. We're gonna have the series number three. I will definitely reach out to you, right. but uh, we we need to also to consider um, writing a book because really it's a it's a new field of medicine. Okay, all right. I do have an ebook, uh, 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 you know, on this. So if anybody. Oh, you have already a ebook. Yeah, I have an ebook. So. Um, okay. Okay. Well, you can go ahead and put it in Amazon, and, and I can help you to promote it here. People will buy it. Right. Well. It's about a hundred pages, so um, yeah. I mean that that would be nice if you go ahead and put in Amazon. Just give me the link, and we can just promote it here so that people can follow up with uh, with your lecture. And, and the reason I don't record, and I gave you everybody to record because I gave you that pass, is that I want people to attend the meetings. That's the whole purpose of it. Because if they start recording, they start waiting for the recording. So I want people to come here and attend and discuss and learn from them and learn from their. Uh, patients and their um, um, so they'd be part of the of the of the equation here. But thank you very much, Dr. William. Thank you, everybody here. Uh, looking forward to see you on Monday tomorrow. Dr. William has his own meeting on eight p.m. So hopefully we'll be attending his. Uh, you who you have tomorrow? You didn't have enough of this. I'm doing it again for Dr. Farshian on on Wednesday. I'm on part three for him. So. Okay, great. So tomorrow, what you're going to present? Well, tomorrow we have David Kahn. He's going to be doing um, uh, P PEMF, um, and, you know, uh, environmental toxins. So Okay, good. So tomorrow, 8 p.m., we'll see you tomorrow. Dr. Bill. Yes. If you can send me a link, because I, I don't know, maybe you lost my, uh, my email or something. I haven't been receiving the uh, invites. All right, I'll 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 send you a link and I'll make sure I'll I'll check to see why you aren't you aren't getting it. Okay. Right. Yep. Okay, you got it, sir. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you all. Um, I'll be back sometime. <laughs> and uh, uh, in in that slideshow there is there is a a protocol that we use for for lab testing. So. Uh,
Uh, we will, I will schedule it for the third part soon. We can keep up. All right. Thank you all. all right. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. It.